Live from New York City for our audience worldwide, Bloomberg's The Fed Decide starts right now. This is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Bloomberg Surveillance, The Fed Decides. Begins right now on TV and radio for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. About 28 minutes away from potentially another rate hike from the Federal Reserve. Looking at an equity market that's positive by four tenths of 1%. TK25, and then what is the pause around and, the corner? And then what in the statement, John, you're more interested in the statement. I'm more interested in the presser. We'll see the different nuances there, including our wonderful Michael McKee there as well. What I would suggest going in here is the stagginess of the last 48 hours, and you see it within the data checks we're going to do today. And Lizanne Saunders of Schwab uh, featured this earlier. The difference between the T-bill yield and the benchmark, this is important. We've never been here. Is the, is the inversion that we're seeing on that very wide spread of three month to 10 years. So it's a we've never been here moment for Jerome Powell. The overwhelming consensus coming into this decision is one and done. One more hike at about 2 p.m. Eastern time and then done. For how long? I've got no idea. It is a two part story, as Tom indicated. It's the statement then onto the news conference. The news conference about an hour from now. Lisa, within the statement, there is this one line in the third paragraph. We're all very familiar with it over the last couple of weeks. The committee anticipates that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. Does that go? And what is it replaced with? Given the fact that people are talking about a conditional pause, which I think we're all going to grow to hate very quickly because it means basically whatever you want it to mean. I do think that what I am looking for is dissent. I want to see whether there are people on both sides that think the Fed is doing the wrong thing, whether it's raising rates, cutting rates, or holding rates, and what that means for where the balance of, of weight really is in the Fed going forward. Key phrase there, Bramo, and I'm with you both sides. Tom, the potential for dissent in either direction over the upcoming months. I, I agree with this. Could it's, be pretty it's, interesting. It is wildly symmetric either way, and the ECB to me tomorrow is different. And, and I would say, folks, this is important. You've got to combine this afternoon event with what we see tomorrow with the ECB. Let's get straight to it. Before we get to the ECB, we've got to deal with the Federal Reserve. Your equity market right now, just about positive. Struggling to deliver any gains on a week so far this Wednesday, positive by 0.35%. Yields about four basis points lower on a 10-year 338 in the FX market. Lisa, the dollar shines some weakness. Euro dollar 110.47. I love this. Every day, showing some weakness, showing some strength. Always 110. It's been at 110 for pretty much <laughs> a month now. Here's how we're going to play it out through uh, the rest of the afternoon. We have coming up KPMG's Diane Swank. She is going to speak with us heading into the Fed decision along with TD's Priya Misra and Deutsche Bank's Matthew Lizetti. That will be uh, leading up to that 2 p.m. decision. Then immediate reaction from former Fed uh, Vice Chair Rich Claridge. Bank of America's Michael Gapin and Apollo's Torsten Slock, a real focus there, perhaps, and any tea leaves with respect to uh, some of the uh, lending conditions. And finally, breaking down Chair Powell's news conference, former New York Fed President Bill Dudley and BlackRock's Jeff Rosenberg. John, it'll be an interesting day of nuance, not necessarily massive surprises, I would think. Hey, we'll see. We'll see. I know. Maybe. I'm not there. We'll I think we could see. I think Kit Jukes was right this morning. There could be some surprises. We haven't mentioned the banking stress in the first five minutes yeah. of the program. And that's something we need to talk about, Lisa, through today. And do they have some sort of insight into that? That's also another issue. Oh, they, def they, no, it would, they definitely have insight okay. into it. They know to the minute the deposits and the balance sheets of 20 or 30 banks out there. And possibly some sort of preview of that senior loan officer uh, opinion survey, which we're all really curious about. If they do, that's Barn when we'll look at a parse. They're going to make that data through. more regular. I, I feel like I've been talking about that for months. <laughs> Did you just call that a barn burner? It's, oh, yeah. I can't <laughs> wait. It's like the minutes. Tom's, some, Tom's taking the day off. Some, <laughs> some, <laughs> some. <laughs> some to be around May 8th. Some, several, <laughs> a few loans. I mean, that's where we are. Diane Swank joins us now. <laughs> Please. One of our favorites, chief economist over at KPMG. Diane, wonderful to start the program with you. Let's start with a statement. It comes out in about 24 minutes. Most people expecting a rate hike. One are you, and two, how do you expect the statement to change in about 20 minutes? Yeah, I think they do have to be nuanced, although you know, nuance is the word of the day. That said, First, I think they have to leave the door open a crack to additional rate hikes, even though I think they intend to pause and they hope this is the last rate hike of the cycle. The reason they're going to be leaving that door open just a crack <clears throat> is because we've got inflation that looks like at best it's moving sideways. And that's not what the that's not enough 
for the Federal Reserve. I think we also could see a dissent at this meeting. Austin Goolsbee has sort of staked out his ground on this already. This will be the third official meeting that he votes at. And I think one of the things he's very concerned about is that the tightening in the pipeline will do the heavy lifting for the Fed and that they can't calibrate policy and they don't want to go too far mm -hmm. until they know more about that. And you're absolutely right, the discussion you had earlier, that they've already got a preview of what not only what the deposit flows and um, leaving in and out are within the banks, but more importantly, that senior loan officer survey. They've been talking to everyone they know to find out right. how much credit market conditions are likely to tighten. Diane, a number of months ago, we had the most fascinating National Association for Business Economics meetings in Washington. I thought the debate was as vigorous as I've ever seen. The debate at the Fed, are they relying on theory or are they making it up as they go? <laughs> well, you know what? There's a little bit of everything in this. I think it's important to remember that there is no roadmap for where we're at. They are combating inflation. It is not 1994 where they preempted inflation and thought they could fine tune the economy. So I think that's a really bad threshold for a soft landing. But I also think it's important that even though we're combating inflation, it's not the same as the inflation of the 1970s and 1960s, although they want to avert the mistakes of the era. And that seems to be their focus. And I think that's what is important is the majority of the Fed. There's a growing minority that are worried about how much they overshoot and that they can't calibrate a mild recession. And even mild recessions can be difficult to recover from. That said, this is a Fed that has put in their summer of economic projections enough of an increase in the unemployment rate to consider it a recession. And that's what they think is necessary to derail this inflation. I remember an entire month and a half ago, we were all really worried about the Fed possibly signaling some sort of issue in the regional banking uh, sector, and then that spurring some concern. No one's talking about that. Diane, is the Fed concerned about the messaging of raising concerns about the regional banks, given that they want to express some confidence in their strength? They've been very consistent in terms of they want to stand behind how solid the whole overall banking system is, and their message has been very clear on that front. I don't think they're going to waver on that. That said, I think it is fair to assume that additional tightening in the pipeline will do much of the heavy lifting for them. And I have a little empathy for the position that Austin Goolsbee has laid out, where he sort of put a We'll see if he actually executes on it. But I don't think he's the only one in the room that would like to see the Fed wait a little bit and keep the door open to additional rate hikes, but see how much additional credit tightening there is in what could hit the backbone of the labor market, and that is businesses less than 250 employees. They accounted for a record-breaking 70 point 9% of total job openings in January and have since, since lost some steam. The biggest loss in job openings as of end of March was in businesses with less than 10 employees. The important thing for the Fed is it, how rapidly does that credit tightening sort of act like a boa constrictor? Is it slow squeeze on the overall economy and slowly slow things down, or is it more abrupt? My guess is it's more like a boa constrictor at this point in time. And Diana, unfair question. How many more banks need to fail before that position is just untenable at the Federal Reserve? I really can't even answer that. I can't even begin to for a multitude of reasons. But I think what's important from the Federal Reserve's perspective, remember, we saw a lot of bank failures in the early 1980s as well. And I think from the Federal Reserve's point perspective, what they need to see is how much credit tightening is really in the pipeline as a result of the financial market turbulence we've seen. That's very important. And what I'm concerned about is, although they're getting all the readings and they're going to get a preview to that May 8th, uh, senior loan officer survey, we still won't know what actually happens until it happens. This is a Fed that said it's data dependent. Data dependent data is backward looking. I think it's important that they take into account how much they think is going to come in terms of rate hikes. And the question I would ask Chair Powell is how much do they think 
credit tightening in the system already in the pipeline is likely to add, be equivalent to, in terms of Fed fund rate hikes. He said sort of about a half percent oh, see, she, at the last she, meeting. She, she's, That's a question to ask him. Diane's brutal. I mean, she's worse than McKee. Just taking up the I news mean, conference. She's just, I mean, <laughs> I hope everybody's at the news conference. Leesman's over there. Take, what, did, what did Diane say on Bloomberg? That's a brilliant question. Of course. You know. As is everyone else. Diane, thank you. You're going to stick with us, I'm pleased to say. Dan Swank of KPMG, <clears throat> TK, the decision about 18 yeah. minutes away. And you mentioned this today. I don't remember the context, but you parsed that the economy is small business as well. And, and Diane Swank was absolutely brilliant there on the smallness. Employees of 10, 20, 30, they're working off charge cards. They're working off maybe a loan that's three, three months behind. I think the tensions out there, to Goolsby's point, are a little bit greater than the macro babble you're hearing at Bloomberg. Fantastic conversation coming up. Diane Swank, TD's Priya Misra, Deutsche Bank's Matt Lazzetti, with your Federal Reserve decision about 17 or 18 minutes away. The news conference follows that about 30 minutes afterwards. Your equity market, slightly positive. This is Bloomberg. We have the Federal Reserve today, obviously. Likely one and done. One and done. One and done. One and done is probably the answer here. They're going one more. It's going to be a Fed that says, OK, look, we're, we've delivered upon our dots. We remain data dependent. They have said that they're very data dependent. Seems like they're very focused on lagging indicators. The Fed has its credibility at stake here. And it gets really complicated. If they're viewed as hiking into more banking failures, right, this is putting more pressure on the banking sector. They're now moving towards a pause. But really, enemy number one here is still the inflation picture. There is no way that the Federal Reserve is not looking at the set of problems that they have right now and getting very nervous about where they're going to have to put their chips. One and done. This is the countdown to the Fed decision on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Jonathan Farrow alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brown. It's about 15 minutes away with the market shaping up as follows. The problem for this Federal Reserve is they say pause and this market hears cuts. On the S&P 500, positive 0.3%. On the Nasdaq, positive 0.03. And a bounce back for the regional banks and the small caps, the Russell, up by 1.5%. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Take a look at the two-year, 392. The last time the Federal Reserve met... March 22nd at the close on a two year. Where were we? 393. Oh, nothing's happened. <laughs> nothing's happened between <laughs> then and now. Looking at the 10 year down five basis points, 337. And just to wrap things up in foreign exchange, Bramo, looking at the single currency, the euro. Guess where? Yeah. <laughs> Go <laughs> one on, ten. guess. 110. 110. Let's like guess. That. Yeah, yeah. Something it's like pretty that. Much. 110. Honestly, some? 110. Can I just say, Diane Swank was saying, you know, will fault Fed policy act like a boa constrictor? And I'm thinking about that as really being a perfect analogy. Is it a boa constrictor or is it a grizzly bear, right? Is it something that like slowly contracts the economy or is it come in with claws and just tear it apart? I don't know. I think that's really good. Slow. Maybe. And then all at once. Yeah. Perhaps. No yeah, one you knows. know, this is no important. One knows. No, this yeah, is, I know. No, this is, knows. I know, but it's a good analogy. Uh, Diane Swank knows this, and so do Lizetti and Miser as we bring them in. John, you're absolutely correct. It's slow, so slow, slow, and ex post after the fact, and then they go with a vengeance. Because they're after the fact. Two easy things to say today. Yeah. Here's one. <clears throat> okay, here's one. We're data dependent. I think that phrase is the greatest cop out <laughs> in Federal Reserve conversations I, I ever hear. I can think of a few others, but carry it's on. meaningless. <laughs> okay. And I'll tell you for a few reasons. <clears throat> dependent on what data and how much weight do you put on each data point? When you talk about the totality of the data, the balance between what and what? Now, are you looking at financials, the financial system, financial stocks, stress, the data from last week? CPI, unemployment, Hold on a second. payrolls. Public service announcement. What we all that? have heard all of these phrases so many times I just, that you know, I am completely with you. And I think it's But good. he's it's going well to say it in 40 whatever minutes time. He's going to say we are data dependent. Everyone's going to go, he's data yes. dependent. Lizardi's going to go, are like, you, you kidding know, me? He's data dependent. Yeah. It's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. They've all got their different interpretation of the data anyway. If they were truly data dependent in some kind of mechanical objective way, they would all have the same view on monetary policy, wouldn't they? Except they don't. Here lies the uh, 
the issue. You're always data the, dependent by definition. The level of cynicism kind of here. My children are data dependent. Is, is, is off the chart. We're all data dependent. Let right, us continue with our guests. We've got <laughs> Diane Swank with us here. Tom's trying to keep us on the rails. Diane Swank That's is here. Fair. And as we go to the meeting here in 13 minutes, Diane's begging, bring in Priya. Priya Miser joins us, TD Securities, and Matthew Lozzetti, Deutsche Bank. To have these three on with us, Prefed is all I need to say about a great booking group. Uh, Priya, let me start with you uh, as well. Where's the 10 year yield, the metric that, that we're using here to guesstimate the inversion of three months tens is, is miserable like where's the 10-year yield three meetings from now four meetings from now five meetings from now lower and i think it's because the economy to the earlier discussion uh, the economy is responding to um, the lagged impact of rate hikes. I think that's more the boa constrictor. But then you've also got the grizzly bear, to use your to use Lisa's analogy, because you know you've also got the uh, banking sector that's in contraction. I think there has to be massive bank deleveraging. We're in the midst of that. That's going to accelerate. Yeah. Uh, so you've got rate hikes, QT. I hope QT comes up a little bit today because it's <clears throat> tightening policy and it's not really talked right. about. So I think tight policy is going to slow things down. So we think the 10 year is going to be much lower. Three, four meetings from now, we'll be talking about rate cuts uh, and Matt, not just 100 basis points. I think uh, a lot okay, Just because of the time period, I'm going to race to Matt Lizzetti. Or Matt, you've got the call of the year on a delayed recession. I guess we're finally to the Lizzetti slowdown, the Lizzetti recession as well. How restrictive are we right now? Diane Swan mentioned a number of minutes ago that we may be a lot more restrictive than we feel. How super restrictive are we? Yeah, I think one of the most important things that we heard from Chair Powell at the March meeting was all these financial conditions indices that ignore bank lending conditions should probably be ignored, that we really need to account for what's happening with bank lending conditions, the Fed Senior Loan Officer Survey, credit conditions. There, I, you know, I'm hoping we'll get a, get a good read from Chair Powell today, but the anecdotes that we had in the Beige Book were that you do have probably a meaningful tightening that is taking place there. On our broad financial conditions index, you are basically at the levels that you begin to see around recessions. And so I do think uh, broad FCIs, when you incorporate bank lending conditions, are at levels that are actually pretty tight at the moment. You know, Diane Swank brought up this issue of whether the Fed would answer any questions about how they measure the lag effects. And Matt, I'd love you to weigh in. Are you looking for something similar? Do we have a guide to understand how lagged the effects are and how quickly they're taking hold now? Yeah, I think the Fed has a bit of a tension here. I think for, for so long they were arguing that because of uh, the forward guidance that they gave uh, for how aggressive the tightening cycle was going to be, that they front-loaded a lot of the financial conditions tightening, and therefore they were not as behind the curve. Now I think they're in an environment where they want to emphasize that these lags are still to come and, and playing out over time. I think what we've seen, you know, certainly over the past day or, or, or weeks or so, is that you know, the, these stresses in the banking sector are, are likely still there. They're likely still coming. They're likely still tightening financial conditions as we look ahead. And that is, I think, the reason why we expect it to be the last rate hike of this cycle. And Diane, uh, that is uh, speaking about that as well. Priya, before we go back to Diane, I'm curious from your perspective uh, about that idea, about the rate cuts and what the threshold to do that is. Is it a banking stress issue? And what is the threshold that's enough to get the Fed to act? I think to the threshold to pause is actually not that high. The threshold to reverse policy with inflation remaining high, I think that is a high threshold. And I think the Fed is going to go into the easing cycle, kicking and screaming. I think the threshold is a few months of negative payrolls. And we're far from that. You know, does that happen by December? We think yes. But I would say if it doesn't, they don't cut rates. And they're going to be nervous about the economy slowing down. But I think they really need to see, I mean, some slowdown in the economy is an intended consequence of Fed rate hikes and QT. So I think we need like, much sharper decline in the economy for the Fed to respond. This is not going to be a preemptive Fed into the easing cycle. I think it's going to be extremely reactive. What an interesting point. Dan, I'd love your view on that as well. Do you think the bar is higher for cuts or higher for the Fed to start resume hiking again? I think the bar is higher for cuts, and I, I agree entirely with that. I think another important issue to think about here is the Federal Reserve said that they would raise rates and hold them. They did that knowing and thinking that inflation would continue to cool, especially core inflation would continue to cool, and that would raise real interest rates and add additional tightening into the cycle. One of the concerns they'll have is, although I believe there's a lot of tightening still in the pipeline, and I hope we hear some of that from the Federal Reserve Chair today, I think the Fed has to 
think about what happens if inflation doesn't cool as rapidly. That means that real rates will not rise as rapidly as well. And that's why they may leave the door open a crack to additional rate hikes for the most hawkish on the Fed. The other side of this is what happens on the other side of what they call a mild recession. Hard to calibrate, first of all, once you get into a recession. Second of all, Many of the mild recessions we've had have been very difficult to recover from. And there is a very long tail out there in commercial real estate, notably the office market, that as yet we see those office leases lapse. Even in the most occupied office markets in the country, like Houston and Dallas, where you have 60 percent occupancy at the moment, they're already officially at double digit vacancy rates. And that's before they've got the largest backlog of office space in the pipeline they've ever had. Matt, do you agree with that, that there's actually a higher bar to uh, cut rates than to raise rates at a time when the market seems to have a different view? The market thinks that it's a given that the Fed's going to aggressively uh, cut rates through the end of this year and into next. I think no doubt it's actually a higher bar to, to cut rates. I think to get there, you need to see the unemployment rate rise materially. I think you need to see what are likely recessionary dynamics playing out. I do think that the bar to, to hike rates at some point later uh, may not be as high as, as the market is, is currently assuming. Uh, while we expect that you're going to see this tightening of credit conditions take place due to bank lending standards, it's still uncertain at the moment. You know, we'll see what we get in the survey data. But so far, it is, I think, still uncertain. And what we do see in the inflation data uh, is resilience. It's been broad based. We've seen core goods inflation pick back up. We've seen private rental estimates actually pick back up. And so I do think you're likely to, to be in an environment where mm -hmm. inflation is sticky and the Fed is very heavily reliant on the credit conditions doing the work for them. Priya, you're monitoring the markets and nothing's more out of whack, as I mentioned earlier, than the three month, 10 year uh, spread. I guess it's not stochastic. It can go ever, ever more inverted. Is there theoretically a break point where a lower 10-year yield is just untenable versus an elevated three-month T-bill? I mean, I think at some point, um, if the Fed does not cut rates and the market's pricing in these cuts, I think the 10-year will struggle to rally a lot more. But, you know, we're talking so much about the Fed reaction function. It's the economic outlook that's extremely uncertain. In fact, when we talk about the curve, I think of what's priced in as a bimodal distribution. There's a view of the soft landing camp that the Fed is on hold for a long time. Then there's the view of the recession. And I think as the probabilities of these two scenarios change, that curve can flatten some more. Um, I do think there's a limit, you know, minus 70, minus 80, I think on two ten starts to get to a floor. And then, you know, it's going to come down to if the Fed is not cutting rates, I think the 10 year will start to sell off because that means the, that soft landing scenario is more likely. We're very much in the hard landing. Um, you know, everything seems to be pointing towards a slowdown. It's just timing that slowdown. And can the Fed get mm -hmm. ahead of it? We think not. Priya, will we see market reaction today? The last couple of times it's moved one way and then it's moved another way three hours later. Same silliness or do we get something profound today? You know, I think Jeff Powell's going to try and buy time. I mean, if he hikes 25, that's almost priced in. I don't think he's going to commit a whole lot to beyond that. So you would think that's not a big market reaction. But there's a lot of nuggets in the press conference. Does he brush aside the bank issue, calling it just a few bank mismanagement? That's a hawkish message. Does he actually say that inflation's much higher than the Fed thought? That's a hawkish message. Or does he talk about credit conditions? We think that senior loan officer survey, we don't have it. We think the Fed has it. Is, are they more concerned about it? That would be a dovish sign. And the market's skittish. I mean, we're moving 20 basis points on a daily basis. So I, while I don't expect a big market moving Fed, there's anything in there that's a surprise, I think, could move the market. And then we have payrolls to look forward to and, and CPI. And that will, I think, bring the market back in line. Do you think you'll come anywhere near to accepting any responsibility whatsoever? for what's happened in the banking sector? I think not in terms of monetary policy. In terms of supervision, I think Vice Chair Barr's report did put the blame a bit on the rules as well as Fed supervisors, which I thought was very brave of the Fed. So I think they might refer to that, but not rate hikes are supposed to tighten conditions, and that's what they did. Why banks, some banks were more impacted by others, I think that the Fed is going to push back. I think I don't think the Fed takes responsibility on that front, but certainly on the supervision front. It's certainly not clean. It's a dirty way of doing it. But Matt Lazzetti, is this a feature, not a bug, of monetary policy? 
Look, I think it's a feature of monetary policy that the Fed is, is looking to tighten bank uh, lending conditions. They're looking to tighten financial conditions. I think the big surprise recently has been that they haven't tightened as much as anticipated. Credit spreads have been so tight. Uh, so this is, I think, a feature. I think it is pushing you know, things in the right direction. Obviously, they don't want financial instability concerns, and they will deal with that to the, to the extent that they can through other tools. But tighter financial conditions, tighter credit conditions is a necessary condition for them to be able to achieve their dual mandate objective. Diane, I wanted to give you the final word going into the news conference, not just the decision, the decision about two minutes away. 30 minutes after that, Chairman Powell delivering that news conference, you gave us a bit of a tease earlier in the conversation, what you'd ask Chairman Powell. Can you elaborate on that, Diane, what you'd like to hear from the chairman today? Well, I'd like to know how much they think there is tightening in the pipeline and to emphasize something that Priya made the point of is that it's a bimodal distribution and that's why the Fed isn't concerned about the fact that some expecting rate hikes and some not. That is, some are expecting a hard landing and some are not. And the Fed is less concerned about that. But I think the most important issue we want to know right now is how much do they see credit tightening conditions tightening? I think it's easy for the Fed to say we're divorcing uh, combating inflation and rapid rate hikes from financial stability, but breaking up is hard to do. And in fact, the Fed has always used rate cuts as a form of stabilizing financial markets. That's not an option when they're combating inflation. True. Diane, thanks for being with us. Alongside Priya Misra, Matt Lazzetti, Diane Swank there. We are about 60 seconds away from a Federal Reserve decision. Live on TV and radio, special coverage will continue. 30 minutes after that, we'll have a news conference with Chairman Jay Powell. TK, what are you looking for in the next minute? Uh, what I'm looking for in the next minute is definitions of pause. The 18 ways they can say pause. I hate this phrase, hawkish pause. <laughs> we're going to have a hawkish pause. Got no idea what we're going to get. A dovish action. It's just a primal screen to not do what your mandate is and to go somewhere with a slower U.S. economy. And the bet's out on this. I mean, you take Ed Hyman, he's looking for second half recession, much like Matt Lozetti, and you look at Neil Dutta going completely the other way. Bramo? I'm going to look for control find regional banks. <laughs> That's it. I'm going to look for control find lending standards, control find credit tightening. I want to understand what they know about this. Decision 15 seconds away. Here's the price action going into it. Positive 0.3% on the S&P 500. Your bond market shaping up as follows. Two year, 10 year, 30 year. The two year 392.84 on a 10 year yield 337.49 with the decision. Here's Mike McKee. A hawkish pause. Fed officials, as expected, raised their target rate by 25 basis points to five to five and a quarter percent. But they go on to suggest that the longest and the steepest tightening cycle since the 1980s may be about over. The statement drops wording, anticipating some additional policy firming, now saying the committee will closely monitor incoming information and assess the implications for monetary policy. In determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate. The committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. The vote was unanimous. The economic summary notes a modest pace of growth in the first quarter, robust gains, uh, job gains, and still elevated inflation. Lisa, don't worry about the uh, control search function because there's no change in the their estimate of the financial stability situation. They go on to repeat, the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. Tighter credit conditions for households and businesses are likely to weigh on economic activity, hiring, and inflation. The extent of these effects is uncertain. The committee remains highly attentive to inflation risks. And finally, no change in the pace of QT, still capped at $95 billion a month. A short, sweet statement, but it does suggest that we are going into a possible pause. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mike. Let's whip through the price action for you. In the equity market, a lift on the S&P 500 up by almost 0.5% on the S&P. A move lower in yield to the front end by five basis points. Call it six. We're down to about 390 on a two-year. Let's just get to the FX market just briefly. Guess where it is, Bramo? Euro dollar. <laughs> I guess that the dollar 110. is 110. 110. <laughs> yes. 110.74 on the euro against the US dollar. You see the move there. Much stronger euro, much weaker dollar off the back of some of this, reflecting the move lower in yield. So just to summarise what Mike McKee just went through, third paragraph in a statement, that one line of the last meeting we were all talking about for so long, the committee anticipates that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. 
Replaced with this, so I'll read through the quote again for you. The committee will closely monitor incoming information and assess the implications for monetary policy in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time. The committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation <coughs> and economic and financial developments. TK, just a little bit to get through there. A little bit to get through, and maybe a sea change, a little bit of excitement here, but it gets us to... Uh, I want to count the number of questions in the press conference where he doesn't have a prepared statement. I think that's maybe easier to count than the ones with a prepared statement. They're all going to be there, and they're going to be carefully uh, written, to say uh, the least. Someone that's written those statements, Michael Gapin, joins us now, head of U.S. economics at Bank of America. And joining us at our headquarters, Torsten Slock, chief economist, Apollo Global Management. Torsten, let me begin with you. You do these wonderful vignette notes. Which of your little vignettes describes the American economy Jerome Powell has to deal with? Which is the latest thing you see at Apollo that matters to Jerome Powell? Well, I think what's really interesting in this statement is the weight on the highly uncertain effects of the banking crisis. And on the other hand, they are very express, explicitly saying the committee remains highly attentive to inflation risks. So it's still this incredible laser focus on inflation. And I do think that inflation in round numbers at 5% is still way too high relative to the 2% target. So they're still looking in the rear view mirror and saying, we just don't know quite yet how bad this banking crisis is going to be. And we just don't know, therefore, how much credit conditions are going to tighten. Michael Gape and I would talk to you about the bank Banking crisis, but you'd probably walk off the set with a hook from Mr. Moynihan, so we won't go there. <laughs> Michael Gapin, I want to talk to you about Fed policy, and I want to get right to it off this press conference. What will we learn about the June meeting? I think the, the main thing on the June meeting is we can't rule out further policy rate hikes. We don't think we will need to raise rates. We think we're, we're done, as Torsten said. We want to evaluate how the ongoing stresses from, from the regional bank fallout will are affecting activity. But I, the message will be, we, we don't know entirely that, that we're done. It's possible that the spillover effects will be limited. The labor market will remain relatively solid and we may have to do one or two more. We can't fully rule out action in June at this point. Where are we going to be June 14th? Bramo, let's talk about it. Let's go through the statement. So this is what they said back on March 22nd. They were talking about the financial stress. The banking system is sound, resilient. The extent of these effects is uncertain. The committee remains highly attentive to inflation risks. Let's go to the new statement, second paragraph. Same stuff. Banking system is sound and resilient. The extent of these effects remains uncertain. Well, that's one extra bank that's failed since the last time they said that. And I wonder on June 14th if they'll be using the same language again, Bramo, and how many other banks will be talking about at the same time. And that everyone will agree. Do you find it interesting that there was no dissent, given the fact that we've heard so much dissent in all the talk that we've gotten from some of these Fed members at a time where there is a great deal of uncertainty, but pretty polarized views and strong ones at that? I find it very amazing, Torsten Slock, that there is no dissent today. Do you? Well, I do think that their focus on inflation is really just continuing. I mean, they have said for a long time, we got to get inflation down to 2%. And the honest look at the data is that inflation is just not moving down to 2%. And now you're on top of that, have the housing market showing more signs of recovery. And that has a weight of 40% in the CPI. And if home prices and owners could and rent starts to go up again, you could really have inflation sticky at very high levels. So I think they're keeping the optionality, the flexibility here at What's the moment. What's awesome, you've said credit crunch is coming. You said credit crunch was here. Isn't that going to take care of it for them? Yes. Yeah, so the problem is that the credit crunch is somewhat remote from the recovery in the housing market because the labor market is still strong. So there's all these domino breaks that need to fall in place before we need to see the labor market soften. And Jay Powell has clearly said we need to see the unemployment rate go up. And we're just not quite seeing that yet. We'll see on Friday where we get. But you're absolutely right. There's a number of things that need to happen first. And it's all monthly data before we can come to the conclusion that things are truly slowing down. And therefore, inflation is coming down to their target. Michael, can you weigh in on this? Basically, is the implication here that in the Fed's data, perhaps that we don't even see, the stresses in the banking system really are not that great, or it's really just been uh, perhaps overblown by individuals like myself, and that actually the inflationary outlook is still the preeminent concern, even with the ability to to possibly not raise rates. I think that's a fair characterization in the sense that the statement says it is still the preeminent risk. That doesn't mean they're not worried about banking system stresses. They certainly are. They will show up with the lag. They don't show up right away. Our, our work suggests it, it could be two to three quarters. Um, certainly a shorter lag relative to policy rate hikes, but it's not 
instantaneous. Uh, so I think they're in this balancing act where the, the macro data is still pretty good on balance. They think they're going to get some excess tightening out of banking system stress until they know where that lands. Inflation is still the number one concern. I think that's what the statement's trying to balance at this point. Torsten, to Diane Swank's question, how do we measure the lag effects? Uh, well, one data point we get next week, which is the Fed's you know, also survey, is at least one very important observation in getting how bad was it actually here in the, in, in the latest data. And meaning we already get some information about the second quarter telling us what are banks' willingness to lend? Did they tighten lending conditions to large firms, to small firms? Overall, that will be a very important at least step on the way to figuring out how severe this is. But it's very clear when you think about it, I mean, the 14th and the 16th bank in the U.S. having unfortunately to collapse and go under. I mean, two balance sheets of more than 200 billion. This is not just a small corner of the financial system. This is going to have a fairly significant impact. And as Michael was saying, the risks are that now financial conditions in the regional banks, of course, will tighten. And with the regional banks or the small banks making up 40% of all lending and 30% of assets in the banking sector, this is uh, something that well, you should be quite worried about the downside risk for the macro. You know, every bank has a different fabric, Michael Gape, and I think Brian Moynihan loves the micro data of banking. With the reach you have at your institution, what's the temperature that you take of the banking into the real estate system? How does that work into your weekly note or what you're going to write off of this Fed meeting? I think if I could also just you know, pivot a little bit off of what Torsten said there in, in terms of next week and the, the tightening and the senior loan officer survey, does it stay focused on commercial real estate and CNI lending or does it migrate into the consumer and to your point, the, the residential real estate market? Because right now the, it, there is a bit of a split. It's tightening towards firms and commercial real estate but not so much towards the consumer and residential mortgages. The consumer is on better footing domestic. The, the housing market domestically is frozen in its tracks a bit, but the banking sector is still willing to lend into that sector on, on net. So I think that that will, will be key to, to kind of gauge the you know, downside effects or the outlook from my perspective. Second half of the program. So now time for your useless slogan number two of the program. It was data dependent previously. It is now, it is not 2008, which is the one that people love to say at the moment, Torsten. It is not 2008 because it makes you sound really intelligent, sophisticated. You lift it and you know that this is not 2008. <laughs> it means nothing. Every crisis is different. Of course it's not 2008. It's ridiculous to even have the conversation. It means nothing. We're always benchmarking to the extreme. Always. We do it with tech stocks. It's not 99, 2000 except bad things still happen. It's not 2008. I find that slogan, that phrase, useless. Let's park it. You said it's important. It is still not good. Banks are failing. One, two, three, four. Throw in Credit Suisse, make it five. How big is this problem? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. If you look at the CRE as a share of the economy compared to residential real estate as a share of the economy, it is small. In particular, CRE offices is even smaller. But there are some indicators that are worse than in 2008. If you look at the University of Michigan question about what are your interests in buying a durable good, are conditions good or bad, and the share of the population that's saying that things are bad because credit conditions are tight is now double at the level it was in 2008. So both for consumer credit conditions have been tight Tightening. And the New York Fed also has a question where they ask households, have you been declined access to credit? That's at the highest level in a decade. So you also have, going back over the last 10, 15 years, that we have a situation, in particular when it comes to credit conditions, that things are not moving in the right direction. You could say, well, this is because the Fed is raising rates, but adding a banking crisis to the Fed raising rates is just creating this risk of a nonlinear slowdown. So, Mike, for a long time, the Federal Reserve has talked about acting ex post after the fact, should they shift to ex ante, given essentially what's playing out before our eyes in the banking system? Uh, not until they get more clear evidence that inflation's coming down. And therein lies their, their conundrum, right? It's their primary focus. They have to get inflation down to two. Uh, they've got uncertainty to, to deal with. So they can't be too preemptive unless they're going to, you know, they risk missing then on, on their inflation mandate. So Yes, at some point they may have to be preemptive, but I don't think we're going to get that message now. Yeah, because okay. by definition, data dependency, dependency is looking in the rearview mirror. 
So if you refuse to look out through the front mirror and not look at everything that's going on in front of you, you will, of course, focus on, as Michael is saying, on the past data and not so much on quantifying the very difficult issue we have in front of us. I keep thinking about the boa constrictor and the grizzly bear. Uh, we were talking earlier with Diane Swank about the boa constrictor just kind of tightening around the economy. Mike, how quickly can the economy just absolutely fall into a downward spin? Or are we so far away from that type of recession, that type of downturn, that that just doesn't seem probable? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't think that that's a, a base case. But I mean, to, to answer your question, right, it, the sudden stop theory of, of recessions is all about, you know, it's, it's when when credit flow stops. That's that's your problem. Uh, so that, you know, that could happen very quickly, meaning in a matter of a couple of months, you could you could certainly see that we're not looking for that. Um, certainly, we think we're going to get some excess tightening out of the regional bank stress that will help slow the economy down. But I don't think a hard landing from us is, is a base case uh, at the moment. The sudden stop theory would tell you, yeah, if there is a major credit shock coming, uh, if, it, if it happens you know, forcefully and fairly uniformly across not just small banks, but medium and large, then you're going to see those, those effects pretty quickly. We're, we don't think we're in that world yet. And, and I, I agree with that. I, I mean, the, the bottom line here is that there are many other sources of financing than the regional banks. Of course, private capital, there are markets, securitization, securitized credit cards, auto loans, and those other sources of financing have been able to pick up some of the slack. And thankfully, credit spreads are still at reasonable levels. So that means that the regional banks can be replaced to some degree by other sources, including private credit. Can I give you both a final word on this? I've asked this question a few times today. I think we all have over the last couple of weeks. Do you believe that monetary policy objectives are in conflict right now? with financial stability. So at least from my chair, I mean, the way I think about that is that you cannot say that it's completely separate what's going on in the banking sector relative to hitting the inflation goal. Of course, hitting the inflation goal is about cooling the economy down. It's about cooling inflation down. And in that process, cooling the financial system, cooling credit conditions also involves an impact on banks and in particular, in this case, also on regional banks. Mike Gapin, your take? I would agree with that. The two are not entirely separate. Uh, obviously, when you tighten monetary policy, it, it will uh, increase the cost of the credit, slow the growth rate of credit. That could put some institutions under under stress. They're not entirely separate. I, I would associate with Torsten's remarks there. Hey, Mike, great to catch up with you. It's Mike really said wonderful. in the last week or so, Thank enough you. juice for one more hike, enough juice for one more hike, and we got <laughs> one more hike. I love that line, Mike. You know that. Torsten Slock of Apollo. Torsten, great to catch up with you, buddy, as always. Okay. Right, right now, as we go to Bill Dudley later in the program, the former president of the New York Fed, we are advantaged by the former vice chair of the Federal Reserve System, Richard Claret of Columbia, and, of course, global economic advisor at PIMCO. Uh, Dr. Claret, I just want to cut to the chase. You wrote an economist essay on about the IMF meeting that I hope everybody at the Fed read, which is it's really going to be hard to get back to a 2 percent level. Where are we heading across the meetings of 2023 with the inflation dynamic you describe in your Economist article and with what we see from the Fed? Where are we going to be in June and on to the December meeting? Well, thank you for having me on the show, uh, Tom. I guess a couple of points. I do think in the statement today, uh, as I and I think others expected, uh, they did adjust the language, uh, and so they definitely want to have the option uh, not to hike uh, at the June uh, meeting by including that language on the extent. But I do think this is a committee that will, and we'll see this from the chair today, I imagine pretty soon, is going to emphasize they're, they're not declaring mission accomplished. Inflation is way uh, too high. Um, and certainly this will be, I think, sold, and they believe that it's a pause, and, and they're going to do what it takes. Now, looking ahead, I have written and do believe uh, that, uh, you know, under a plausible scenario that the Fed has laid out in the projections, which I broadly agree with, inflation a year from now uh, could be running uh, in the twos. Uh, but probably not near 2.0, probably north of two and a half, maybe closer to three. Um, and I think at that point, the committee will have to make a judgment. But if it sees progress on inflation, mm -hmm. then it's shown in the, in the, in the SEP projections, they think they can be adjusting rates uh, downward. But I don't think they have to get all the way to two before you see those adjustments. If, if we look at where we are with our start and the calculations that people like you make up to see what the path is forward, there are other ways within the system to be more restrictive. And of course, one of them is banking trauma. Are we more super restrictive now or more tight than the chairman realizes? Well, I, I 
Well, I'm not sure what the chairman realizes, uh, but I do think, and I, I, I certainly believe that what we've seen with SVB, First Republic, Credit Suisse, the cumulative effect of that, even if there are no more disruptions, will be to tighten bank lending. I think that's equivalent to some additional rate hikes. So whatever rate hikes you might have thought the economy needed, say, in late February, probably fewer now, because this is going to slow the economy. But, you know, Torsten, who I really respect, talked about the uh, other markets for supply and credit, but a lot of small firms and businesses don't have access to those markets. So when bank lending slows, it'll impact a small business hiring and employment, I think, pretty substantially. Given that uh, credit interruption, do you agree with Diane Swank and Matt Luzzetti earlier, who said that they think that the bar is higher to cut rates than to raise rates again after a pause? Well, let me think through that. I, I think uh, that inflation's just too damn high. Uh, it, it's not three point something, it's in the fours. Uh, whatever progress appeared to be uh, evident in the data in the winter has now if, at best stalled. And so, yes, I think this is a committee uh, that is going to be very reluctant uh, to ease until it really does start to see inflation moving down sustainably. And, and so I would agree with that. So right now, as we look at this statement and we understand what you're saying, what more do they have to see in the banking sector in order to say, OK, hold up, this is something really serious that needs a little bit more scrutiny? Well, I, I guess, um, you know, I, I guess it's an evolving uh, situation. We, as we've, we've resolved uh, two uh, significant uh, banks, uh, resolved in the sense that they, they collapsed and they had to be acquired, uh, with, facilitated by the FDIC. Look, let me say what I do believe. The banking system as a whole in the U.S. has enough capital has enough liquidity and is profitable. So this is not an issue about the banking system per se, but clearly there are uh, fragilities uh, among certain banks, in particular uh, in that category between 100 to 250 billion, uh, and we may not have seen the last of that. If you are just tuning in live on TV and radio, this is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance covering the Federal Reserve decision from about 20 minutes ago. They hiked interest rates 25 basis points. If you're interested in the language shift in the statement that we got from last time, last time they said the committee anticipates that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. A couple of lines have changed around that. The line now reads, in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to return inflation at 2% over the time, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy. Off the back of this, your equity market positive on the S&P by 0.4%. That's on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields a bit lower at the front end. Not a big move. That move phased just a little bit. We're down about three, four basis points mm. on a two-year, 392. Just to look at foreign exchange briefly, the euro stronger, dollar weaker off the back of all of this, 110.65. The news conference, you're laughing, aren't you? 110 <laughs> yes, euro dollar, you love that. Yeah, it's great. 11 <laughs> minutes away from that news conference. <laughs> it doesn't seem to change, Rich. I keep saying the same thing. Rich, I just want to jump in on the banking stress. Your former colleague, John Williams of the New York Fed, has really played down the role the Fed has played in this by hiking interest rates from zero to five so quickly in a little more than a year. I'm just wondering what your assessment of that is, the contribution of Fed policy over the last 12 months to what we've seen play out at the regional banking level. Good question. I have enormous regard and worked closely with John for, for, for nearly four years. I think as a Fed official, he, he is careful in, in how he chooses his word. I'll just tell you what, what, what I think. I think in every rate hike cycle, um, banks that have exposure to interest sensitive uh, assets are, are going to face uh, challenges. You know, in the case of First Republic, they held a lot of mortgages. Mortgages get hurt when the rates go up. In the case of SVB, they held a lot of, uh, you know, securities. And so, and so I think banks do maturity transformation. They borrow short and lend long. And when bond yields go up a lot, some banks are going to be, uh, are going to be challenged. Uh, and so I just think it's an inevitable part of, uh, of monetary policy. As I said, the banking system as a whole is sound, but banks that took, have big exposure to rising rates that they didn't hedge right. are, are not surprisingly going to get hurt. And I can ask you this because you're the monetary guy. If you're the regulation yeah. guy, I couldn't ask you this, Dr. Clarita. But, you know, for, for you, it works. And with your experience and your public service to the country, it's real simple. Everybody's scared stiff. LIBOR's back to where it is. This new SOFR's back to where it is. Kathy Jones over at Schwab is just out with where the FDTR uh, rate is. It's back to where it was, which is 06, 2006. Michael Spence was eloquent in 2010 about the regulatory failures leading into 07, 08, 09. Are we there again? 
Tom, I don't think we're there. Uh, I don't believe we're there. Uh, what I will, what I will say uh, is uh, that, um, um, and I think the report that we got uh, out of the Fed and the and the GAO, I certainly read both of them uh, carefully. Um, and clearly, there were things that were missed, not so much in regulation, but perhaps uh, in, in, in supervision. And I do think that uh, we will see that uh, changed uh, uh, pretty quickly. And certainly, I think that would be a good idea. Rich, you know the Federal Reserve in your time there has been heavily criticized over the last few months regarding this issue. Can you share some of your experience in your time? Did these issues ever come up at board meetings that you attended around the names that have failed? over the last two months? Were these flagged in any way, shape or form at the board level in DC? Well, let me just let, 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 let me just say uh, this. Uh, I was I was surprised uh, by, by both of these based upon my entire experience. Uh, uh, and, 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 and in particular, uh, what, what I would say is um, um, there has there, there was a focus. It was in statute in 2018 that the Fed should tailor to the individual banks regulation and supervision. Um, I think that that certainly is important, but I think these reports do indicate uh, that that needs to be improved, and I think it will be improved, and it should be improved. I guess another way to ask uh, this, Rich, is just whether this goes all the way up to Jerome Powell in terms of his oversight of individual regional bank uh, regulatory exercises. In other words, is he somebody who would have known some of the granularities here, just to give us a window into what that process is? Yeah, I think I think I'll just leave my my answer uh, at that. Obviously, I've not been in the building uh, for 15 uh, months, uh, and I'll just leave my answer at that. All right. Well, just to just to give you a show sense. to a pause. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, Rich, you know the reason why this is important is because people often think of these as independent items, right? You've got on one hand policy, and you definitely have an inflation problem. But John, you have to wonder if at a certain point you're kind of challenged if you have a regulatory. Miss, miss, mistake, I should Rich, say. I don't think we're going to let this go. You were there. You guys knew that you were hiking aggressively. SVB's gone under. Signature Bank, First Republic, Silvergate. When you were hiking interest rates this aggressively at the Federal Reserve, was this on your radar? And, Rich, if it was on your radar, why was nothing done about it in a sufficient way to prevent this from ultimately materialising? Well, I was there in 2018 uh, when we hiked rates up to 2.5% to and paused uh, uh, at, at that level. Uh, I continue to say, as I did earlier, uh, when I got a similar question, uh, the banking system as a whole is sound. It has a lot of capital and uh, liquidity. And so at a top-down macroeconomic right. level, it, it certainly uh, was, was not then a concern. Rich, what's so important here to John's question, yeah. and I know there was a pandemic and all of the estimation of the glide path of the great medical miracle of getting out of the pandemic, but a lot of cynics would be saying that well-meaning people have been basically practicing modern monetary theory with the Biden stimulus in whatever form it was, and now we're trying to extricate ourselves from it. How do we extricate ourselves from the Fed, the deficit, the debt ceiling, the other worries that our listeners and viewers have? What does he do in the press conference to help us extricate ourselves from this dilemma? Well, uh, it, the, I think there are a lot of moving parts there. I think yes. uh, J Jay Powell is going to focus on doing uh, his job, keeping at it till the job is done, but being attuned and attentive and sensitive to what we're seeing uh, in the financial system. And I don't, I don't expect him to move beyond that. But, Tom, you are right. The thrust of your question, these are all uh, related, and obviously right. they all impinge on monetary policy. This is the heart of the matter from the head of economics at Columbia University for so many years and what he did with Gertler. John, this is a Fed that has to get back to a laser focus on what the original mission was. Through the pandemic, there were all these other issues. The social, uh, the social policy that was, you know, it's gone off in the... And then and that the was, crisis was driven by, in. let's be clear, that was driven by the chairman himself. Yes, I, I agree. I totally agree. But the point is to, to what the former vice chairman is saying, they're going to get back to a more focused process. That would be one guess. Well, let's focus on the next four minutes. In about four minutes' time, we will have a news conference with Chairman Powell. Rich, let's wrap it up there. What would be your focus going into this news conference, just as a spectator now from outside the Federal Reserve, looking yeah. at this play out? 
Well, thank you for that uh, question. I do think that uh, the, the statement today will, will, will be helpful uh, in that because I do think the goal coming into the meeting, notwithstanding what we saw with First Republic, was, was to give themselves the option uh, to, to pause. Um, and, uh, but certainly I think the chair will stress that they're not, uh, it's not mission accomplished and they've got a lot of work uh, to do. So I think, uh, I think we'll hear a fair amount of references uh, to uh, uh, to that because I think he and the committee do want to guard against the pause being heard as done or pause being heard as rate cuts uh, are imminent. That sounded like a thanks for not asking me about the banks again, Ramo, I think. <laughs> Richard Clarida, thank Rich, you. Thank you so much. The former Rich, Fed that's... Vice Chair, wonderful to get your perspective on this monetary policy decision. Going into the news conference in about three minutes' time, 25 basis point hike delivered, widely expected. One and done the phrase you've heard so many times coming into this. Are we truly done, Lisa? And for how long? Because you are never truly done, are you? There's always something next. We're data dependent. I just mm, want to tweak you. Okay. But listen, this is the issue right now, is what data, and that is really my question, is it going to be the senior loan officer opinion survey? Do they already have that? And if so, what guidance can they give us? Oh, and if it's not that, how much are you looking at specific components within the inflationary reads? These are some of the issues, as well as, of course, the big elephant in the room. TK, it's going to be an interesting 60 minutes, isn't it? I, I think it is. I've said all along this press conference is going to be interesting in how he frames it out to the coming meetings uh, here. What, what's so interesting, is, is, is Professor Clareda alluded to, is the wide set of issues here that are really outside the capabilities of this institution, and yet he's got to allude to them. Will he comment on them? Well, there's another one, we'll isn't it? To see. We haven't talked about it in the last 60 minutes, the debt ceiling. Nobody wants to talk about it, because what can you say? But ultimately, you'd have to well, think you get to the June decision, Elisa, and you could be at a very interesting point down in Washington, D.C. How much is the debt ceiling debate tightening financial conditions in the very short end and making the job even more difficult around regional banking? Because you're seeing those three-month T-bill yields at the highest levels now going back to 2001. Is this because of monetary policy? I don't think so. I think this is a debt ceiling disruption kind of issue. Also, if you get the kind of spending cuts that the Republicans would like to see, Tom, You've got to factor that into uh, your projections I, at some point as well. I, that's clearly outside the scope of this press conference. But what I would go back to is their estimate of the real economy. And do we get any whisper of the knowledge they have? And McKee is very big on this. They have knowledge about the banking system on a day-to-day -day basis. Far, it's like almost like military intelligence, far greater than anything we have. Does that give him a confidence here if he knows good things or not? The other way, I don't, I don't know. And what will he choose to share? I think Lisa's yeah. been on top of this all along. May 8th, right? Yeah. May, 8th, May 8th, the senior loan officer opinion survey we're all waiting right. for. You'd imagine, Lisa, he's got a decent idea of what that's going to look like when it comes out next week. So how much of a preview can he give? Can he be like, it's, you know, not that bad? Don't I, worry I think, about it. You know, <laughs> and, and John, the presser here, and I'm going to do this in 10 seconds. For those of you on Bloomberg Radio, it's a different view, a different set of wonderful flags at the Fed, the podium, the people lined up. It's a it's a whole new set, a whole new look. I think taking after Lagarde, the set matters. I say, Tom, it looks precisely like the last set <laughs> yeah, that he no stood at. Has it really I changed? I wasn't here for the it last look like meeting. It doesn't look like it's they changed to me. must have changed it last time around. You're more detail-focused, Tom. Maybe it has yes. changed, but I can't notice the difference. <laughs> We're waiting for Chairman Powell to walk into that room, a 25 basis point interest rate hike. Going into it, your equity market is positive by 0.4% on the S&P 500. The bond market yields are just a a little bit lower by three basis points on a two-year 393 yes tk he's late i mean what's it mean what's its signal what's his signal <laughs> what's his signal he's going through the senior loan officer opinion <laughs> survey just, just to make Please sure everything's go. okay this line is actually line. this is actually unusual usually he's pretty prompt have you noticed that this he, is actually he could be on the phone with goals i'm not going to read too much into chairman powell being seconds late <laughs> he's walking into the room right now I the will. chairman of the federal reserve <laughs> after hiking interest rates by 25 basis points let's listen in Good afternoon. Before discussing today's meeting, uh, let me comment briefly on recent developments in the banking sector. Conditions in that sector have broadly improved since early March, and the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. We will continue to monitor conditions in the sector. We're committed to learning the right lessons from this episode, and will work to prevent events like these from happening again. As a first step in that process, last week we released Vice Chair for Supervision Barr's review of the Federal Reserve's supervision and regulation of Silicon Valley Bank. 
The review's findings underscore the need to address our rules and supervisory practices to make for a stronger and more resilient banking system, and I'm confident that we will do so. From the perspective of monetary policy, our focus remains squarely on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I understand the hardship that high inflation is causing, and we remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Today, the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by a quarter percentage point. Since early last year, we've raised interest rates by a total of five percentage points in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2 percent over time. We are co also continuing to reduce our securities holdings. Looking ahead, we'll take a data-dependent approach in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate. I will have more to say about today's monetary policy actions after briefly reviewing economic developments. The U.S. economy slowed significantly last year, with real GDP rising at a below trend pace of 0.9 percent. The pace of economic growth in the first quarter of this year continued to be modest at 1.1 percent, despite a pickup in consumer spending. Activity in the housing sector remains weak, largely reflecting higher mortgage, mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains very tight. Over the first three months of the year, job gains averaged 345,000 jobs per month. The unemployment rate remained very low in March at 3.5 percent. Even so, there are some signs that supply and demand in the labor market are coming back into better balance. The labor force participation rate has moved up in recent months, particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54 years. Nominal wage growth has so shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. But overall, labor demand still substantially exceeds the supply of available workers. <clears throat> Inflation remains well above our, our longer-run goal of 2 percent. Over the 12 months ending in March, total PCE prices rose 4.2 percent. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 4.6 percent. Inflation has moderated somewhat since the middle of last year. Nonetheless, inflation pressures continue to run high, and the process of getting inflation back down to 2 percent has a long way to go. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by, by <clears throat> our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation pose, poses to both sides of our mandate, and we are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2 percent objective. At today's meeting, the Committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by a quarter percentage point bringing the target range to 5 to 5 and a quarter percent, and we're continuing to the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. With today's action, we have raised interest rates by 5 percentage points in a little more than a year. We are seeing the effects of our policy tightening on demand in the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy, particularly housing and investment. It will take time, however, for the full, full effects of monetary restraint to be realized, especially on inflation. <clears throat> in addition, the economy is likely to face further headwinds from tighter credit conditions. Credit conditions had already been tightening over the past year or so in response to our policy actions and a softer economic outlook. But the strains that emerged in the banking sector in early March appear to be resulting in even tighter credit conditions for households and businesses. 
In turn, these tighter con credit conditions are likely to weigh on economic activity, hiring, and inflation. The extent of these effects remains uncertain. In light of these uncertain headwinds, along with monetary policy restraint we've put in place, our future policy actions will depend on how events unfold. In determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to return inflation to 2 percent over time, the Committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. We, we will make that determination meeting by meeting <clears throat> based on the totality of incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation. And we are prepared to do more if greater monetary policy restraint is warranted. <clears throat> we remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keep our longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below-trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Hi, Gina Smila, New York Times. Thanks for taking our questions. I wonder if you could tell us whether we should read the statement today as a suggestion that the committee is prepared to pause interest rate increases in June. And I also wonder if the Fed staff has in any way revised their forecast for a mild recession from the March minutes. And if so, what a recession, like what they're envisioning, would look and feel like when it comes to, for example, the unemployment rate? So. Uh Taking your question, of course, today our decision was to raise the federal funds rate by 25 basis points. Uh, a, a, a decision on a pause was not made today. Uh, you will have noticed that uh, in the, in the uh, statement from March, we had a sentence that said the committee anticipates that some additional policy firming may be appropriate. That sentence is, is not in, in the statement anymore. We took that out, and instead we're saying that in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to return inflation at 2 percent over time, the committee will take into account certain factors. So we th that's, a, that's a meaningful change that we, we're no longer saying that we anticipate. And uh, so we'll be driven by incoming data, meeting by meeting, and, uh, you know, we'll approach that question at the June meeting. Uh, so the, the, um, the staff's uh, forecast is so. Let me say, start by saying that that's not my own most likely uh, case, which is really that, that, that the economy will continue to grow at, at a modest rate this year. And I think that's uh, so different people on the committee have different forecasts. That's, that's my own assessment of the most likely path. Staff produces its own forecast, and it's independent of the forecasts of, of the uh, participants, which include the governors and the Reserve Bank presidents, of course. And we think this is a healthy thing, that the, that the staff is writing down what they really think. They're not especially influenced by what the governors think, and vice versa. The governors are not taking what the staff says and just writing that down. So it's actually good that, that the staff and individual participants uh, can have different perspectives. Um, so broadly, uh, the, the forecast was for a mild recession, and by that I would characterize as one in which the rise in unemployment is smaller than is, has been typical in modern era uh, recessions. Um, I, I wouldn't want to characterize the, the, the staff's uh, uh, forecast for this meeting. We'll, we'll leave that to the minutes, but broadly, broadly similar to that. Thank you, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. I'm wondering if you can talk about the account of possible effects of a debt limit standoff. You've said repeatedly that the ceiling must be raised, but do you see any economics effects of even getting close to a default, and what type of situation would that look like? Um, <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't want to speculate specifically, but I will say this. Um, these are fiscal policy matters, for starters, and they're uh, there for Congress and the administration for the elected parts of the government to deal with, and, and uh, they're really cons you know, consigned to them. From our standpoint, 
I, I would just say this. It's essential that, that the debt ceiling be raised in a timely way so that the U.S. government can pay all of its bills when they're due. A failure to do that would be unprecedented. Uh, we'd be in uncharted territory, and the, and the consequences to the U.S. economy would be highly uncertain and could, could be quite averse. So uh, I'll just leave it there. We, um, we don't give advice to either side. Um, we just would point out that, it, that it's very important that this be done. And the, the, the other point I'll, I'll make about that, though, is that no one should assume that the Fed can protect the economy from the potential, you know, short and long-term effects of a failure to pay our bills on time. We, we uh, uh, it's, it would be so uncertain that it's just as important that, that this, we never get to a place where we're actually talking about or even having a situation where the U.S. government's not paying its bills. And just to follow up, was discussion around the uncertainty of a possible standoff, did that affect today's monetary policy decision at all? I wouldn't say that it did. It was, of course, it's something that came up. We talk a lot about risks uh, to the to the outlook, and that that will that come up. A number of people did raise that as a risk to the outlook. I wouldn't say that it was important in today's uh, monetary policy decision yet. Steve. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, can, oh, thank you. Yeah, my, uh, Steve Leisman, CNBC. Can you? Tell us what the Federal Reserve Board did in the wake of that February presentation where you were informed that Silicon Valley Bank and other banks were experiencing <coughs> interest rate risks. And can you tell me what supervisory actions you've done in the wake of the recent bank failures to make sure that banks are currently appropriately managing interest rate risk? And kind of part three, but it's all the same question here. Do, do you still think this separation principle that monetary policy and supervision can be handled with different tools. Thank you. Sure. So the February 14th presentation, I didn't remember it very well, but now, of course, I've gone back and <laughs> looked at it very carefully. I did remember it. And what it was was a general presentation. It was a, an informational briefing of the whole board, the entire board. I think all members were there. And uh, it was about interest rate risk in the banks and, and um, lots of data. And there was one page on Silicon Valley Bank which talked about uh, you know, the um, amount of losses they are uh, mark to market losses they had in their portfolio. There was nothing in it about uh, that I recall anyway about um, about the risk of a bank run. So it was I think the takeaway was they were going away to do a an assessment, a vertical, uh, sorry, a horizontal assessment of of banks. It wasn't um, it, it, it wasn't presented as an urgent or alarming situation. It was presented as a, as a as an informational, non-decisional kind of a thing, and I thought it was a, a good presentation and, and uh, as I said, did remember it. Um, in terms of what we're doing, of course, uh, I think banks themselves are, are many, many banks are now uh, are attending to liquidity and uh, taking opportunity now, really since, uh, since the events of, of early March, to, to build liquidity. Um, and um, you asked about the separation principle. I, you know, I, I, like so many things, it, it's very useful. Um, but, you know, ultimately it has its limits. I mean, I, th I think in this particular case we have found that uh, the monetary policy tools and the financial stability tools are not in conflict. They're both they're working well together. We've used our, our uh, financial stability tools to support banks through our lending facilities. And um, at the same time, we've been able to uh, use our monetary policy tools to foster maximum employment and price stability. I don't mean to be argumentative, but the, the staff report said SVB has significant interest rate risk. It said interest rate risk measurements failed at SVB, and it said banks with large unrealized losses face significant safety and soundness risk. Why was that not alarming? Well, I mean, I didn't say it wasn't alarming. It was they're pointing out something that they're working on and that they're on the case that, that you know, that uh, I'm not sure whether they mentioned, um, I think they did actually, they mentioned um, that they had taken regulatory action matter or supervisory action in the form of matters requiring attention. So I think that was also in the presentation. I think it, it was to say, yes, this is a bank and there are many other banks that are experiencing this, these things and, and we're on the case. Thank you. Let's go to Victoria. Um, hi, Chair Powell. Uh, I wanted to ask you, obviously with the recent bank turmoil, we've seen uh, multiple banks by other banks. And I was just curious whether you think that further consolidation in the banking sector would increase or decrease financial stability, and whether you have any concerns about the biggest bank in the U.S. Uh, getting even larger. 
So, I, you know, we certainly don't, and I don't have an agenda to further consolidate uh, banks. There's been, consolidation has been a factor in the U.S. banking industry really since um, interstate banking and before that even. It goes back more than 30 years. You, when I was in the government a while back, I think there were 14,000 banks. Now there are 4,000 and change. So that's, that's going on. I personally have long felt that having small, medium, and large-sized banks is a, a great part of our banking system. Uh, you know, the, the community banks serve particular customers very well. Regional banks serve very important uh, purposes, and the various kinds of GSIBs do as well. So I think it's healthy to have, a, a, you know, a range, a range of different kinds of banks doing different things. Um, I think that's a positive thing. Um, is it a financial? So I, I would just say in terms of J.P. Morgan uh, buying uh, First Republic, um, the FDIC really runs the process of closing and selling a closed bank completely. That, that is their role, so I really don't have a comment on, on that process. Uh, as you know, there's an exception to the deposit cap uh, for a failing bank. So it was legitimate, and I think the, the FDIC, I believe, is bound by law to take the bid that is the least cost bid. So I would assume that's what they did. So but do you have any concerns about the fact that they're, they're getting larger in general? So I, I, th I think it's probably good policy that we, we don't want the largest banks doing big acquisitions. That is the policy. And, uh, but this is, a, this is an exception for a failing bank, and I, I think it's actually a good outcome for the banking system. It also wouldn't have, would have been a good, uh, good outcome for the banking system had one of the regional banks bought, bought this company, and that could have been the outcome. But ultimately, it, it, we have to follow the law in our agencies, and the law is it goes to the, uh, the, the, the least cost bid. Colby. Thank you, uh, Colby Smith with the Financial Times. Uh, at the March <coughs> meeting, you mentioned that a tightening of credit conditions um, from the recent bank stress could be equal to one or more rate increases. Uh, so given developments since then, how has your estimate changed? Yeah, I think I, I, think I followed that up by saying it's, um, it's uh, quite impossible to have a precise estimate of the words to that effect. Um, but in principle, that's the idea. You know, when we, we've been raising interest rates and that raises the price of credit and that, in a sense, restricts credit in the economy working through the price mechanism. And, you know, when banks raise their credit standards, that can also make credit tighten in, in a kind of broadly similar way. Um, it, isn't, it isn't possible to make a kind of clean translation between one and the other, although firms are trying that and, and you know, we're trying it. But ultimately, we have to be we have to be honest and humble about our ability to make a precise assessment. So it does complicate the task of achieving, you know, a su sufficiently restrictive stance. But I think conceptually, though, we think that, it, you know, interest rates, will, in, in principle, we won't have to raise rates quite as high as we would have had this not happened. The extent of that is so hard to predict because we don't know how persistent these uh, th these effects will be. We don't know how large they'll be and how long they'll take to be transmitted, but that's that's what we'll, what we'll be watching carefully to find out. Uh, just to quickly follow up, what, what does it suggest about the scope for the committee uh, to pause rate increases perhaps as early as next month, uh, even if the data remains strong then, if, if it's having some kind of substitute effect? It's that this is just something that we have to factor in as we as we want to find ourselves. So I guess I would say it this way. Um, the assessment of, uh, of the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate is going to be an ongoing one, meeting by meeting, and we're going to be looking at the factors that I mentioned that they're listed in, in the statement, the obvious factors. That's, that's the way we're going to be thinking about it. Um, and uh, that's really all we can do. As, as I say, it does complicate. We, we have, you know, a broad understanding of monetary policy. Credit tightening is a different thing. There's a lot of literature on that, but translating it into, into rate uh, hikes is, is uncertain. Let's say it adds even further uncertainty. Nonetheless, we'll be able to see uh, what's happening with credit conditions, what's happening with lending. We get, there's a lot of data on that, and you know, we'll, we'll factor that into our decision making. 
Uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters, thank you. Um, so noting that the statement dropped the reference to uh, uh, sufficiently restricted, restrictive, I was wondering, uh, given your baseline outlook, whether you feel this current rate of five to five and a quarter percent is in fact sufficiently restrictive. So that's gonna be an ongoing assessment. We're gonna need data to accumulate on that. Um, uh, not an assessment that we've made. As, uh, that, that would mean we think we've reached that point, and I, I just think it's, uh, it's not possible to say that with confidence now. Um, but nonetheless, you, 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 you will know that the uh, summary of economic projections from the March meeting showed that in, at that point in time that the median participant thought that this was, this was the appropriate level of the, of the ultimate uh, high level of rates. We don't know that. We'll, we'll revisit that at the June meeting. Um, and that's, you know, we're just going to have to, before we really declare that, I think we're going to have to see uh, data accumulating and, uh, um, and, you know, make that, as I mentioned, it's an ongoing assessment. And a follow-up on credit, if I could. Could you give us a sense of what the SLUS uh, survey uh, indicated? Uh, it was already, uh, you know, I think, 40, 45 percent of banks were tightening credit as of the, uh, the last survey. Uh, what did this one show, and how did that weigh into to your deliberations? So we're going to release the results of the SLUS on May 8th, in line with our usual time frame. And I, I would just say that the SLUS is broadly consistent when you see it with how we and others have been thinking about the situation and what we're seeing from other sources. You will have seen the Beige Book and listened to the various earnings calls that indicate that mid-sized banks have, some of them have been tightening their lending standards. Um, banking data will show that lending has continued to grow, but the pace has been slowing really since the second half of last year. Uh, Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, the argument around the end of last year and the beginning of this year to slow down the pace of increases was to give yourself time to study the effects of those moves. After the bank failures in March, uh, as you've discussed, the Fed staff projected a recession starting later this year. So my question is why it was necessary to raise interest rates today, or, or put, put differently, if the whole point of slowing down the pace was to see the effects of your moves, and now you've, for the last two meetings, been seeing the effects of those moves. Why did the committee feel it was necessary to keep moving? Well, we, um, the reason is that we, again, with our monetary policy, we're trying, trying to reach and then, and then stay at, a, uh, for an extended period, a level of, of policy, a policy stance that's sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do with our, with our tool. Um, I think slowing down was the right move. I, I think um, it's enabled us to see more data, and it will continue to do so. Uh, so, I, I, you know, we, we really, um, you know, we have to balance. We always have to balance the risk of not doing enough and, and not getting inflation under control against the risk of maybe slowing down economic activity too much. And we thought that this rate hike, along with the meaningful change in in uh, our policy statement was the right way to balance that. And just to follow up, you know, what you said in response to Howard's question, you'll need data to accumulate to determine if this is a sufficiently restrictive stance. Does that data need to accumulate, or could it accumulate over a longer period than a six-week intermeeting cycle? I, yeah, I mean, I, as I mentioned, I, I would just say that this assessment will be an ongoing one. Uh, you. You know, you can't with with economic data. Yeah, you, you you can't. You you've seen take take inflation from it. Look look back. We've seen inflation come down, move back up two or three times since March of 2021. We've seen inflation have a few months of coming down and then come right back up. So I think you're going to want to see that. Uh, you know that a few months of data will will persuade you that you've that you've got this right kind of thing. And, you know, I, we, we, we have the luxury. We've, we've raised 500 basis points. I think that policy is tight. I think real rates are probably that you can calculate them many different ways. But one way is to look at the nominal rate and then subtract a, a reasonable estimate of, of uh, let's say, one-year inflation, which might be 3 percent. So you've got 2 percent real rates. That's meaningfully above what most people would, many people anyway, would, would assess as, uh, you know, the neutral rate. So policy is tight. And you see that in interest-sensitive interest, interest sensitive, um, 
activities, and you also begin to see it more and more in, in other activities. And if you, if you, put, the, um, you put the credit tightening on top of that and the QT, uh, that's that's ongoing. I, th I think I think you feel like you know we're, we're we may not be far off or you know, possibly even at that level. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Powell. Edward Lawrence with Fox Business. Um, so if the Federal Reserve gets down to the 3% inflation, as the projections show at the end of this year, or close to it, would it be okay for you for a prolonged period of 3% inflation uh, and hoping for some outside event to move down to 2% target? I, look, I think we're always going to have 2% as our, our target. We're always going to be focusing on getting there. Uh, but would you be okay with, with a prolonged 3%? Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, let me just say that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for inflation going down to 2% over time. I mean, we, uh, that's, that's not a question that's in front of us, and it would depend on so many other things. But ultimately, we're, we're not looking to get to 3% and then drop our tools. We have a, a goal of getting to 2%. We think it's going to take some time. We don't think it'll be a smooth process. Uh, and. You know, I think we're going we're gonna to need to stay at this for a while. How does the other side of the mandate, the job side, once you get to 3 percent, going from 3 to 2, how does the other side of the mandate weigh balance? I think they, they you know, they, they will both matter equally at that point. Right, right now, you have a, a labor market that's still extraordinarily tight. You've still got 1.6 job openings, even with the lower job openings number, for every unemployed person. Uh, we do see some evidence of softening in labor market conditions, but overall, you're near a 50-year low in unemployment uh, wages. You all will have seen the, the wage number from uh, uh, late last week, and it's you know, whenever it was. And uh, you know, it's it's a couple percentage points above what would be what would be consistent with two percent inflation over time. So we do see some softening. We see new labor supply coming in. These are very positive developments, but um, the labor market is very very strong. Whereas inflation is. You know, running high, well above our well above our goal, and right now we need to be focusing on bringing inflation down. Fortunately, we've been able to do that so far without unemployment going up. Matt. Hi, Chair Powell, Matthew Bosa with Bloomberg News. So many analysts noted at the time of the March FOMC meeting that at least half of Fed officials' projections did imply or seem to imply that a recession was in their baseline forecast as well, given the strong uh, first quarter GDP tracking estimates. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you could kind of elaborate on you know, why you're optimistic that a recession can be avoided, given that that's the Fed staff's forecast, possibly also the broader committee's forecast as well, and, and also, of course, uh, most private sector forecasters. Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, I, I know what's printed in the summary of economic projections and all that. I, I don't think you can deduce exactly what you said about what participants think, because you don't know what they were thinking for first quarter GDP at that point. They could have been thinking about a fairly low, low number. Anyway, in any case, I'll just say I, I continue to think that it's, it's possible uh, that, that this time is really different. And the reason is there's just so much um, excess demand, really, in the labor market. It's, it's interesting is, you know, we've raised rates by five percentage points in 14 months, and the unemployment rate is three and a half percent, pretty much where it was, even lower than it, where it was when we started. So job openings are still very, very high. We see by surveys and much, much evidence that, that th conditions are, are cooling gradually, but it's, it really is different. You know, it wasn't supposed to be possible for job openings to decline by as much of the, as they've declined without unemployment going up. Well, that's what we've seen. So we, I, there, there are no promises in this, but it, it just seems that to me that it's possible that we can continue to have a cooling in the labor market without having the big increases in unemployment that have gone with many you know, prior episodes. Now, that would be against history. I, I fully appreciate that. That would be against the, the pattern. But I do think that, it, that, this, that the, the situation in the labor market with so much excess demand Yet, you know, uh, wages are actually, wages have been moving down. Wage increases have been moving down. Uh, and that's a good sign, um, down to more sustainable levels. So I think that, I think it's still possible. I, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, the case of, um, of avoiding a recession is, in my view, more likely than that of having, having a recession. But it's not, it's not that the case of having a recession is, I don't rule that out either. It's, it's possible that we will have what I hope would be a mild recession. 
The committee also noted in March that wage growth was still well above um, levels that would be consistent with 2% inflation. Do you see that as well? And could you kind of explain, you know, how you come to that judgment? Sure. So we, we look at a range of wage, um, wage measures, and then you know, that's a nominal. And then so you assume wages should be equal to productivity increases plus inflation. And so you can, you can look at, you know, the employment compensation index, average hourly earnings, the Atlanta wage tracker, compensation per hour, basically those four and many others. And you can, you can look at, at, at what, the, what they would have to run at over a long period of time for, to, for that to be consistent with 2% inflation. They can deviate. You know, mar corporate margins can go up and down. And there is a feature of long expansions where they do go down, where labor gets a bigger share toward later, later in, a, in a recession. Um, it, sorry, later in an expansion. So yeah, the, those, you know, and we calculate those. And you, you have to take the precision with a degree of, uh, a degree of salt. But um, I would say uh, that what they will show is that you know, if, if, the, um, if wages are running at 5%, 3% is closer to where they need to be. Wage increase isn't closer to 3%, roughly is what it would take to get to be consistent with inflation over a longer period of time. <clears throat> I did, by the way, I, I don't want to, I do not think that wages are the principal driver of inflation. You're asking me a very specific question. I think there are many things. I think wages and prices tend to move together, and it's very hard to say what's causing what. But, I, you know, I've never said that, you know, that, that, that wages are really the principal driver, because I, I, I don't think that's really right. <clears throat> Great. Uh, Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. Well, you mentioned profit margins. Uh, those have expanded, uh, did expand sharply during this inflationary period. And while there are some signs that they are starting to decline, uh, many economists note they haven't fallen as much as might be expected, given that we're seeing at least some pullback among consumer spending. So speaking of causes of inflation, do you see expanded profit margins as a driver of higher prices? And if so, would you expect them to narrow soon and, and uh, contribute to reduced inflation in the coming months? So higher profits and higher margins are what happens when <clears throat> you have an imbalance between supply and demand. Too much de demand, not enough supply. And we've been in a situation in many parts of the economy where, uh, where supply has been fixed or, or not flexible enough. And so, you know, the, the way the market clears is through higher prices. So to get, I, I think, as uh, goods pipelines uh, have, have gotten, uh, you know, back to normal so that we don't have the long waits and the shortages and that kind of thing, I think you will see uh, uh, inflation come down and you'll see, you'll see corporate margins coming down as a result of a return of full competition where there's enough supply to meet demand and then, it's, then, it's, then you're really back to full competition. That's, that would be the dynamic I would expect. Michael McKee for Bloomberg Radio and uh, Television. Uh, can you tell us something about what your uh, policy reaction function is, your policy framework is going forward? When you look at the economy at the next meeting, are you looking at uh, incoming data, which is by definition backward looking? Are you going to be forecasting what you think is going to happen? Are you ruling out the rate cuts that the market has priced in? I didn't catch the last part. Ruling Mar markets have priced in uh, rate cuts by the end of the year. Oh, Do yes. you rule sorry, that sorry, out? Sorry. Okay, I got it. So what are we looking at? I mean, we look at a combination of data and and forecasts. Of course, the whole idea is to is to create a good forecast based on what you see in the data. So we're always we're always looking at both, you know. And it will, of course, it'll be the obvious things. It'll be readings on inflation. It'll be readings on on wages, on economic growth, uh, on the labor market. Um, and uh, all of those many things. I think a particular focus for us going now over the past six, seven weeks now uh, and going forward is going to be what's happening with, uh, with credit tightening. Are small and medium-sized banks tightening credit standards? Uh, and, and is that having an effect on, on, uh, on loans, on lending? And you know, so we can begin to assess um, how that fits in with monetary policy. That, that'll, that'll be an important thing. I just, you know, we'll be looking at everything. It's, again, I would just point out, we've raised rates by five percentage points. We are shrinking the balance sheet. And now we have uh, credit conditions tightening, not just in the normal way, but perhaps a little bit more due to what's happened. 
And we have to factor all of that in and, and make our assessment of, uh, you know, of whether our policy stance is sufficiently restrictive. And we have to do that in a world where policy works with long and variable legs. So this is challenging, but you know, we, we will make our best assessment, and that's, that's what we'll be thinking. What about uh, the idea of rate cuts? Yeah, so um, we on the committee have a, have a view that inflation is going to come down not so quickly, but it'll take some time. And in that world, if that forecast is broadly right, it would not be appropriate and, and to, to cut rates, and we won't cut rates. If you have a different forecast, and you know, uh, markets are, have been from time to time pricing in you know, quite rapid reductions in inflation, um, you know, we'd, we'd factor that in. But that's not our forecast. And, and of course, the, the history of the last two years has been very much uh, that inflation moves down, particularly now if you look at non-housing services. It really, uh, it really hasn't moved much, and it's quite stable. And uh, you know, so we think we'll have to uh, demand will have to weaken a little bit, and uh, labor market conditions, conditions may have to soften a bit more to begin to see progress there. And again, in that world, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be appropriate for us to cut rates. Courtney. Uh, Courtney Brown from Axios. Um, I'm curious how you view the role of the overnight re reverse repo facility in the context of the current banking stress. Um, do you think it's contributing to the stress by making it more attractive for money market funds to compete with banks for deposits? And uh, did the committee discuss any changes to the structure of the facility? Or do you see that being put on the table in the future? Thanks. Sure. So we, we looked at that very carefully, as you would imagine. And it, you know, the, it's. Um, it's really not contributing. We don't think now it hasn't actually been growing. It, you know, it, it moved up, it moved down, and then moved back up to where it was. What, what happened in the um, when when there were the big deposit flows, which by the way have, have really stabilized now. What happened was institutional investors took their uninsured deposits and put them in government money market funds, which bought paper from the federal home loan banks and things like that. Um, over the course of uh, of, of maybe the last year, retail investors had been gradually, as they do in every tightening cycle, they've been gradually moving their deposits into higher yielding places such as CDs and, and other things, including money market funds. So that's a gradual process that is quite natural and happens during a, a, a tightening cycle. What was unusual really was the, the institutional investors moving their uninsured deposits and spreading them around and things like that. But it doesn't seem to have had any, any effect overall on the, uh, over the overnight repo facility. Um, that is really there to, to help us keep rates where they're supposed to be, and it's, it's serving that purpose very well. Sarah Ewald Weiss, CBS News. Uh, I want to go back to the debt ceiling for a moment. I know you talked about that in terms of fiscal policy, but can you just speak towards what the impact of a default would mean for Americans across the country, the markets, and borrowing? Yeah, I, I would just say it's. Um, I, I don't really think we should be. We shouldn't even be talking about a world in which the U.S. doesn't pay its bills. It just. It just shouldn't be a thing. And and again, I would just say we. We don't. The, no one should assume that the Fed can do, uh, can can really protect the economy and the financial system and our reputation globally from from the damage that such a, such an event might inflict. Scott. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Scott Horsley from NPR. Uh, in his report last week, Vice Chair Barr identified a couple of the factors that he thought contributed to the. Regulatory or the supervisory lapses at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, a policy change in 2019 to exempt all but the biggest banks from strict scrutiny, and also what he called a, a sort of cultural shift towards less aggressive oversight. You were here in 2019. Do you share that view? And what would it take to get the, the stronger oversight that you and he said in your release would be necessary? So I, I didn't, uh, I didn't take part in creating the report or doing the work, but I do. I have read it, of course, and uh, I find it persuasive. I mean, I, I would say it this way: a a very large, a large bank, not a very large bank, a large bank, failed quite suddenly and unexpectedly 
in a way that threatened to spread contagion into the financial system. Um, I think the only thing that, that I'm really focused on is to understand what went wrong, what happened, and, and identify what we need to do to address that. Some of that is, may, it, it may just have been technology evolving, you know, we have to keep up with all that, but some of it may be our policies and super, supervisory and regulatory, whatever. Well, what our job is now is to identify those things and implement them. And that's the, kind of the only thing I care about is, and I think, I feel like I am accountable for doing everything I can to make sure that that happens. <clears throat> Thank you. Evan Reiser with uh, MNI Market News. Uh, Chair Powell, are we in the early stage or nearing the end stage of the banking turmoil among regional banks? And secondly, do you still have uh, a bias to tighten rates? Is that what the statement is saying? So, um, I guess I would, uh, I guess I would say it this way. Um, there were three large banks, really, from the very beginning, uh, that were at the heart of the stress that we that we saw in early March. The severe period of stress. Those have now all been resolved and all the depositors have been protected. I think that the resolution and sale of, uh, of First Republic kind of draws a line under that period of, uh, is an important step toward drawing a line under that period of, of severe stress, okay? I also think um, we are very focused on uh, what's happening with credit availability, particularly, you know, with what you saw in the, um, in the beige book and you will see in the sluice is, is uh, Small and medium-sized, small and small and medium-sized banks who are are feeling that they need to tighten credit standards, build, build liquidity. What's going to be the macroeconomic effect of that? More broadly, we we will continue to very carefully monitor what's going on in the banking system, and we'll factor that assessment into our decisions in an important way going forward. Okay, Greg. Thank you, Fred Chairman. Uh, Greg Rabb from Market Watch. I just wondered if you've done any reflection on on your own actions during this crisis and leading up to it over the last since you've been Fed Chairman. I think I've heard you say a couple of times that you deferred to the Vice Chair for Supervision. Do you think that was the right way to go about this? And yeah. Comments on that. Thank you. Sure. So let me say, first of all, I've been chair of the board for five plus years now, and I fully recognize that we made mistakes. I think we've learned some new things as well, and we need to do better. And as I mentioned, I thought the report was unflinching and appropriately so. I welcome it, uh, and uh, I agree with and will support those recommendations. And I do feel that I'm personally accountable to do what I can to foster uh, uh, measures that will address the problems. So on, on the vice chair for supervision, you know, the, the place to start is, is the statutory role, which is quite unusual. The vice chair, uh, it says, shall deploy policy recommendations, develop policy recommendations for the board regarding supervision and regulation of depository institution companies, uh, and shall oversee the supervision and regulation of such firms. So this is Congress establishing a four-year term for someone else on the board, not, not the chair, as vice chair for supervision, who really gets to set the agenda <clears throat> for supervision and regulation for the Board of Governors. Congress wanted that person to be, to have political accountability for developing that agenda. So the, the way it works, the way it has worked in practice for me is I've had a good working relationship. I give my, my counsel my input privately uh, and and that's I offer that, and um, I have good conversations, and, and I try to contribute constructively. I respect the authority that Congress has deferred on that person, um, including working with with uh, Vice Chair Barr and and his predecessor. And um, I think that's the way it's supposed to work, and that's appropriate. I'm, I I believe that's what the law requires, and you know, uh, but it, but it isn't. It, I, I wouldn't say it's a matter of complete. Deference. It's more. I have a. I have a role in in presenting my views and discussing, having an intelligent discussion about what's going on and why. And in a, you know that that's that's my input. But ultimately, that person does get to set the agenda and gets to th take things to the board of governors, and really in supervision has 
sole authority over supervision. <clears throat> I just wondered if you had any regrets. Or was there anything that, you know, decisions that maybe you regret now in light of what's happened? I've had a few. Um, Sure. I mean, you know, who doesn't look back and think that you could have done things differently? But honestly, you don't, you don't get to do that. I, again, my focus is on what you control the controllable. As one of my great mentors used to always say, control the controllable. What we control now is make a fair assessment, learn the right lessons, figure out what the, the fixes are, and implement them. And, and I think that, that uh, Vice Chair Barr's report is an excellent first step in that, but we've got to follow through. <clears throat> Hi there, Megan Casala with Barron's. Did the possibility of pausing at this meeting come up at all, and how seriously was that considered? I'm curious if you can give us any color as to whether there were any initial concerns about raising rates again or what those discussions entailed. So support for the, um, <clears throat> for the 25 basis point rate increase was very strong across the board. Um, I would say there are a number of people, and you know, you'll see this in the minutes. I don't want to try to do the head count. Um, uh, in real time, but uh, people did talk about pausing, but not so much at this meeting. You know that we're. I mean, there's there's a sense that we're we're that, you know, we're much closer to the end of this than to the beginning. That you know, as I mentioned, if you if you add up all the tightening that's going on through various channels, it's it, it, we we feel like we you know we're getting close or or maybe even there. But that again, that's going to be an ongoing assessment, and and we're going to be looking at those factors. Uh, that we listed in the and to determine whether there's there's more to do I'm curious too how to interpret that and and the changes to the statement is the bar higher now to raise rates at the next meeting or would a strong jobs report or inflation print be enough to push the Fed to tighten again I I don't want to I, I couldn't I couldn't really say I just think we're I think we look I think we've moved a long way fairly quickly and I think we, we can afford to look at the data and um, and make a careful assessment Hi, Chair Powell, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. You mentioned a few times about the lessons you learned from the banking crisis, that you would learn the right lessons. Um, what are those lessons? Well, I, you know, I just would start with um, uh, something that's changed, really, which is um, this: the run on Silicon Valley Bank was out of keeping with the speed of runs through history. And that now needs to be reflected in some, in some way in regulation and in supervision. It, it, um, we know, now that we know it's possible, I think, we didn't, no one thought that was possible. No one had, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody thinking that this could happen so quite so quickly. So I think that, you know, that will play through. I, I, I'm, you know, it, it will be up to uh, Vice Chair Barr uh, to really take the lead in designing the, the ways to address that. But I think, I think that's one thing. Um, I, uh, I guess I would just say that. that then, it, you know, that we're going to, obviously we're going to revisit. It's pretty clear we need, to me anyway, it's clear that we need to strengthen both supervision and regulations for banks of this size. And I'm, I, I'm thinking that we're on, the tra on track to do that as well. Can you be any more specific on stress testing or looking at banks that have specific concentrations in certain parts of the economy? Yeah, that's, see, that's, that's what uh, Vice Chair Barr's role really is, and he, he'll take the lead on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> that does it for the main news conference of the Federal Reserve with Chairman Jay Powell there following a 25 basis point increase. Looking ahead on the economy, this is what he had to say. His forecast is for modest growth, not a recession. On policy, he was asked, is this a pause? We're getting closer. We may be there. We discussed it, but here's the important but. A decision on a pause was not taken today. Are we sufficiently restrictive? That's going to be an ongoing assessment. On cuts, Mike McKee pushing hard on that in the news conference. Did you see that? The FOMC's inflation outlook, Tom, doesn't support rate cuts. The only one in the conference where there was really a stumble once again Always. was McKee. Always. If you I are mean, just tuning in on TV and radio, this is a here. special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance. Special. Covering the Federal Reserve's latest interest rate increase with Tom Keane.
who wants to go home alongside Lisa Bramberts. I'm Jonathan Ferrer, who is very happy to stay with you. Your equity market on the S&P 500 is negative 0.3%. We roll over and fade just a little bit. Mm. In the bond market, <laughs> yields down by five basis points. Keep it together, guys. 391 <laughs> on a two-year. <laughs> fade just a little bit there, too. Bit of dollar weakness in the mix for you. Euro strength, the euro against the dollar, 110.57. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme. This is what the chairman had to say. With our monetary policy, we're trying, trying to reach and then, and then stay at, a, uh, for an extended period, a level of, of policy, a policy stance that's sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. We always have to balance the risk of not doing enough and, and not getting inflation under control against the risk of maybe slowing down economic activity too much. And we thought that this rate hike, along with the meaningful change in in uh, our policy statement was the right way to balance that. This assessment will be an ongoing one. The chairman of the Federal Reserve said policy was tight. You put credit tightening on top of that, throwing QT. We may not be far off or possibly even at that level when you get closer and closer to being sufficiently restrictive. I think, Tom, the chairman is struggling to reflect there a consensus on the committee. Yeah without drowning out that consensus on the committee with his own personal view. Absolutely. You can sense how yeah, hesitant he was and, addressing that question. And for those of you on radio, there's a time where he looks down and reads the prepared comments, and we saw that three, four, five times, it seemed, uh, throughout. What I would really emphasize, besides the decline we see down on 200, SPX down 18, is how little the market moved during the press conference. Compared to the last four, five, six press conferences, I don't think there was a gyration, the emotion within the conference. Initially, the people, Tom, described it as dovish. Lisa, I have to say, <laughs> listening to that news conference, that's not my personal assessment of what I heard over the last 50 minutes. Inflation is a preeminent concern, and that's clear. That said, the market has not shifted in its view <clears throat> that this will be the last cut in this rate hiking cycle that has been the fastest going back to 1981. We just witnessed it according to market pricing, and that from here, the next move will likely be a cut, and it could come as soon as September. Mm. And perhaps he he had no conviction about pretty much anything, but he did uh, sort of reflect the seesaw underpinning the debates at the Federal Reserve, at the FOMC, that just gave confirmation to markets. I told you what their new focus was, though, right? Yeah. Credit tightening, Tom. It's going to be a big focus for this committee yeah, and this over the next couple is, of months. This is the overlay of all these other events that are happening, banking, commercial real estate, et cetera. What does that affect on restrictive? And I've repeated this, I think, twice today. It goes back to consummate Mizuho and this phrase, super restrictive. How restrictive are we now? And some would suggest more restrictive than we imagine, just looking at the data. I'm just going to put this out there. I suspect that the senior loan officer opinion survey is going to be really boring. And the reason why is because he made it sound that way. He had a written statement when someone asked him, yes, what does it did. say? And he yes. looks down, he's like, oh, I can't give you any preview, but just to think but, it's in line. And it's, you know, probably we've mm. seen this tightening since the second half of last year. And it's been ongoing, et cetera. So, but this you enjoyed is the last 50 minutes, <laughs> I can tell. I mean, I just was thinking to myself, all these people trying to get him to say something. And he's just like, look, we don't know. And we're doing the best that we can. I think the economy is in better shape than my colleagues. We all agree, though, and yay, kumbaya. The most important headline from the whole thing, looking ahead, we will take a data-dependent approach to policy. You predicted we this. Will date, we, we, will <clears throat> you that, we will be data-dependent. We will be data-dependent. Yeah, well, let's do this right now. Let us jump to someone who's absolutely been out front on the trajectory of the Fed, and that is William Dudley. He's, yes, a Bloomberg opinion columnist, yes, a former uh, president of the New York Fed, but far more a gentleman of Berkeley steeped in our economic history. Bill Dudley, I've been dying to ask you this question. This word pause has come up. And the arch question to me to get to June and on to the rest of uh, what we observe in 2023, if they pause, is it asymmetric or symmetric? Does a pause mean rate cuts to come? Or they can say, we're going to pause and we can go either way. The historians, John Taylor of Stanford across the pond from your Berkeley, Barry Eichengreen and others, would they say there's a precedent to analyzing asymmetric or symmetric pausing? Well, I think they can pause and, and then continue to tighten again if the data turns out to support that. But obviously, when they do pause, they're making a pretty strong statement that they've gotten enough information, that they're confident that 
policy is sufficiently restrictive to use Chairman Powell's terms to bring inflation down to 2% over time. So a pause is going to be a pretty significant event from the from the Fed. Now, obviously, context matters. If we're in the middle of a debt limit ceiling fight at the time of the June FOMC meeting, you might take a pause for other reasons. But I would say a pause will be a pretty uh, important event. What the Fed was trying to do today was say, look, we don't know if we're going to pause or, or, or not at this point. Uh, the message, I think, in the statement and in the press conference was pretty clear. We think we're getting close to a level that's sufficiently rest restrictive. We're not absolutely certain. Right. The data is going to tell us that we have to do a little bit more. We're clearly not going to cut yet. So I think the, the, the pushback that the Fed is making is really to the market's pricing and rate cuts. The Fed thinks that the process of getting inflation down to 2 percent is going to take some time, a lot longer than what the market thinks. I heard one word in the beginning of the uh, comments, and it uh, uh, echoed from Lyle Brainerd. I believe she's at 1600 Pennsylvania this week. And the former vice chair would suggest cumulative. What is the cumulative effect of where we are right now, given how you nailed the need for higher rates to fight inflation? Well, we're certainly in the vicinity of what was sufficient, I think, in my mind. Uh, whether they have to do another, you know, increase or two, it's, it's hard to say at this point. You know, we've come a long way in the last year. As Chair Paul said in his press conference, you go 500 basis point, 5% increase in short-term rates. That's a lot in a, in a year. And we're also starting to see some of the effects of that on the on the banking system so that the Fed has a whole other source of restraint, which is uh, credit uh, conditions are going to tighten because some banks are going to pull off. Now, the hard part, as he said in his press conference, it's very hard to assess how important that ch channel is going to be. My own personal view is it's going to be fairly weak because the problems that these banks face were not that they went out and made bad loans. The problem that, that these banks face is they went out and took a lot of interest rate risk. Bill, were you satisfied with the explanations or the answers to the questions about the supervisory of some of these banking institutions that have failed? Well, I don't think the Fed is, you know, taking the full responsibility for being pretty uh, – slow on this process. I mean, if you go back and look at the November financial stability report, which I did this morning, uh, there's, there's basically no mention of any kind of, you know, interest rate risk mismatch, any kind of liquidity, potential liquidity problem uh, in the bank. So it wasn't just a question of the supervision not being uh, more aggressive with Silicon Valley Bank. I think the Fed basically missed the risk here that deposits could flow out very, very quickly because of the mark-to-market -market losses on some of these banks' balance sheets. Do you think then, Bill, they're still missing it, that they don't appreciate the full extent of it based on, for example, the preliminary look that they got of the senior loan officer uh, opinion survey, which seemed to indicate just an ongoing trend of what they had seen? Are they underappreciating a new pressure in the market? I think that his answer on the senior loan officer survey, it, it was that it's, it's moving in the same direction that it was upward, you know, the tightening of credit conditions, but not in a way that would suggest that the, that the problems of the banking system since mid-March have, you know, led to a significant further tightening of credit conditions. So I think he's basically saying there's not really any new information in the senior loan officer survey. That was my, my sense of his response to that, to, to that question. Dr. Dudley, what you just said is extraordinary. You said basically the Fed missed the ramifications of new digital technology, the speed with which we can move deposits out. A delicate question, if I may, Bill, and that is basically they want Mary Daly's head. There's no other way to put it nicely. You've had experience being a president of a Fed. Do you go after the president of any given regional Fed when there's a major blow up like this? Or is it much more down the food chain looking at the process of supervision and regulation? I think it's a much broader issue about uh, supervisors finding finding problems with banks and then not forcing the banks to remedy those problems in a timely way. Uh, the second issue here was I think the Fed broadly missed the fact that, 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 that this interest rate risk that they had created by being very late to tighten monetary policy, that they created by flooding the bank with deposits by doing quantitative easing, that they created part of the stress on the banking system that arose when they had to tighten monetary policy by 5% in a little over a year. So the Federal Reserve has some culpability here, both in terms of the monetary policy, policy policies that they pursued over the last few years, and also in on the supervisory side. It's certainly culpability. They're not really looking to go out and acknowledge in a major way, that's for sure, based on some of the statements well, we've heard. 
they have to a degree. I mean, I thought the I thought the, the, the Fed report from Michael Barr that came out last week was what did acknowledge that there was a lot of improvement on the supervisory side that that needed to be made. But I don't think the Fed has acknowledged the fact that the monetary policy regime that they followed, which was to be purposefully late in tightening monetary policy, meant you were encouraging banks to take on more interest rate risk, and then those banks got caught. And yep. the Federal Reserve had to raise rates by 500 basis points. Well, that's an assessment your successor, the New York Fed, certainly doesn't chair, based on his most recent comments. Mike McKee's run out of the news conference to catch up with us. Mike, wonderful questioning to the chairman, as always, in the news conference. Thank you for that on behalf of the whole audience. Really pressing him on those rate cuts, Mike. What was your assessment of what you heard in the last 60 minutes? Well, I think basically what we heard was uh, the Fed saying we don't know exactly what we're going to do, so we're going to play it carefully and we will uh, punt on a decision or on forward guidance for now until we get a better read on the economy. Uh, Powell was at pains to say his own personal opinion is we're not going to see a recession, but he also ruled out rate cuts in case uh, somebody is thinking that they might do that soon. So uh, a very cautious Fed here. Uh, if I could, I'd like to ask uh, Bill Dudley a question if he's still with us about that, because um, the data don't change a whole lot in six weeks. What would be the bar for the Fed, since you've been in those meetings, for the Fed to uh, raise rates, to change its mind, to say we need to do more? What would they need to see? I think they'd have to see evidence that the economy isn't slowing, that the labor market's not loosening, that wages aren't coming down, that core inflation's uh, you know not not falling. You know, I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is assess what is sufficiently restrictive in order to get inflation back down to two percent. Before the banking system problems, they thought sufficiently restrictive was higher than what we are today. In fact, Paul was talking about potentially even doing a 50 basis point rate hike not too long ago. And then the banking uh, problems hit. And so that's caused the Fed to lower their estimate of what sufficiently restrictive is. So the data will inform them about what, what sufficiently restrictive is. If the data is really strong, they'll revise up their notion of what sufficiently restrictive is. Well, Bill, are but they going to put more weight we on get... financial sector data or are they going to put more weight on the data coming from traditional indicators? I think they're going to put a lot of weight on what, what they're seeing in terms of the labor market, wages, and inflation. You know, that's really where they haven't made much progress yet. Uh, they're also going to probably take some signal by what's happening in the housing sector, because if you look at the single family housing sector, it looks like it's actually stabilizing. So the policy restraint that's already been put in place looks like it's the, the effects of that on housing are starting to fade. But just a final question from us all. This is something Mike McKee's brought up over the last week in my conversations with him, whether this would be a nod to June 2006. You obviously have a deep understanding of the history of the Federal Reserve. Back in June 06, they wrote in the statement the extent and timing of any additional firming that may be needed to address these risks will depend on the evolution of the outlook and et cetera, et cetera, inflation and economic growth implied by incoming information. Now, Bill, do you think it's a deliberate nod to June 06? when essentially that decision ended up being a pause? No, I don't think they know yet. I think Paul was uh, being truth, very honest when he said that uh, we haven't made any decision about whether we're going to pause yet. I think they think that the probability uh, is higher that they're going to pause, but they haven't actually got there yet. Bill, thanks for that. Wonderful to get your perspective. Bill Dudley there on the latest from Bloomberg Opinion and, of course, the former New York Fed president on this Federal Reserve decision. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme on TV and radio. Special coverage here, Bloomberg Surveillance, after hours, late. <laughs> Very late. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz, Jonathan Farrow. After hours at, like, 3 p.m., which is <laughs> bedtime. It's brought to you by L.L. Bean. we got a pop tent over yeah, here. Yeah, it could be market. Negative 0.6% on the S&P, TK well, in a bond market. We're down seven I, basis I, points now. The two-year right now, yeah. three 88. Equities give way. There's no question about it. I've been looking at Apple. We'll get to that tomorrow. But, John, what, what Dr. Dudley said there is extraordinary. He did not mince any words about this institution missing the effect, the slew, the, the, the Newtonian Agreed. rates of change Agreed. of the interest rate move. And there hasn't been enough talk about this. You can do it on a Bloomberg terminal. It's in your face. And to hear that from Bill Dudley, I don't care that he's an ex-official. That was a scathing rebuke of his institution. A failed on regulatory oversight. To some extent, there's been an acknowledgement of that in the most recent yeah, report, one. But two, to <clears throat> your point, they increased interest rates aggressively from zero to five. They weren't front-loading. They were catching up. 
And because they had to catch up, you've had this rate shock. And that's what Bill Dudley is talking about. I, I know we've got to get to Jeff Rosenberg, but basically, folks, this is Bramo and Farrell all wound up, and me and McKee are more institutionally friendly. I'm sorry, some of the people that... <laughs> hey, the, the, let, some, me, let me clean up what you just well, said. Because, what you mean by that, and I'll leave Mike out of this, is that you have the establishment view? Yeah, and we're just questioning it. You know, it's like 2020. They <laughs> just, put their pants just, on just, one just leg to be at a clear. time, <laughs> like everybody else. But but the bottom line is, here's a guy with immense experience. Bill was in my book. Blah blah blah. Great. He was scathing about the, his institution. Debt crises always happen in instruments that are thought of as safe. That is always what has happened. Back in 2007, 2008, it was the triple A rated uh, debt that was tied to mortgage mortgages that were basically bundled together. So here's the question. Has this Federal well, Reserve, and frankly, regulators more <clears throat> generally, just let me finish, have they basically assumed a complete <laughs> lack of risk in some of the benchmark treasuries that they're using as, like, the safety pools, as the buffers? Yeah. And this really, if it's not appreciated, how much further does it potentially go? You can stock tell it's getting quote. late. You know, no, Grandma's slowly quote. losing it with you, TK. Pacific <laughs> West, Pacific <laughs> West easing into the close. I'm sorry, Pacific West is giving me a 7 down to 6.52. And when you see people like this with this language, it's a enough to make, you know, Jeff Rosenberg's going to get his first gray hair. Jeff's waiting for us. That's why he's aging. Jeff Rosenberg <laughs> of BlackRock joins us right now. Jeff, you followed all of that, not this, all of that meaning the news conference with Chairman Powell. Jeff, your takeaway, please. Yeah, I, I've got three key takeaways here. You know, first thing is when you just look at the totality of this, this is pretty much on uh, spot on for market expectations. The statement all but basically admits to this is a pause. In the press conference, he tried really hard to not say that, but to say that. And I think it's pretty clear that that's, that's where we're at. Second thing that I took away, I'll call it the new Powell arithmetic as to how he gets to uh, the pause in that policy is sufficiently restrictive. And so what is that new arithmetic? It's the nominal rate minus 3% inflation gets you to a 2% real rate. Add to that credit tightening and add to that QT. And that's how he gets to sufficient restrictive. And so I think when we look forward, it's really going to be the assessment on this arithmetic towards sufficiently restrictive. First of all, is 3% the right inflation rate to subtract from that nominal rate? If inflation stays high, that real rate isn't as tight as he's implying. Second piece is, and he admitted this, we don't really know the magnitude of this credit tightening. We only know the directionality. And the third piece is, how much is QT? really generating sufficient tightening in the real economy remains kind of um, uh, very unclear. Uh, and, and, the, and the third key takeaway here, and, and he talked about this, and Mike McKee, great question because you got this out of him, you know, what about rate cuts in the market? And, and he highlighted that's the difference between the market inflation forecast, which is a very aggressive decline back down to 2 percent, versus the Fed's forecast, which is for a much more gradual inflation for, uh, decline. And, and that's what separates market expectations for Fed cuts from the Fed's reiteration again here that they will hold rates at this level for a long period of time in contrast to market expectations. So it gets us back to a, a focus on the inflation data. Is your, is your sense, Jeff, that we just witnessed the last rate hike in this cycle? Well, I, I think we've seen the last rate hike in the consecutive rate hikes. I think there's a pause, and now it's a pause for validation to what I was just describing. Is this really sufficiently restrictive. There was some acknowledgement by the chairman in the data that suggests some uncertainty, that we're not seeing the degree of tightening in the labor market commensurate with a 5 percent increase in interest rates. We're not yet seeing critical measures of inflation in that services x housing inflation coming down at a pace consistent with the attainment of a 2 percent goal. So these are kind of the cautionary tales around. And even the statement in the language says, you know, we're not, we're not moving towards cuts next. We're just pausing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the full cycle is is ended and, and we can claim success. That is going to be about the evolution and the data. Jeff, do you have confidence that the Fed truly does have a handle on what's going on in the regional banks, given what they acknowledge was some pretty significant oversights? And based on what you see in the granular data that you study every single day in order to make trades? 
Well, I, I think, you know, the anatomy of a banking crisis is very hard to assess, you know, whether it's it's done. He got the question. He was very careful about answering it. You know, I think it's clear that this first phase, when he identified the three problematic banks now being under resolution, that putting sort of a line under the, the first phase, you know, and I think that's the case. We can see that in the data. You can see the, in you can see that in the deposit flows. Uh, I think he's very reticent to to make too big and too large of a blanket statement on that, right. given the uncertainties that that uh, we associate with banking crises. I think the second thing is, is really the critical one, and, and that is not the direction of credit tightening. Yes, this is tightened credit. It's important to note, and he highlighted this in the upcoming sluice, uh, as well as in the Beige Book data, we had seen tightening in credit conditions already in place before the March banking crisis. What's unclear here and very hard to measure is what on the margin has this done to accelerate that relative to trends that were already in place for a 500 basis point tightening. And, and as he admitted, oh. with honesty and, and humility, very hard to make that assessment. And I think that's the, the right assessment in terms of the magnitude or the quantity right. of the credit tightening. And Jeff, we're seeing the banks roll over here as well. Uh, Keith Brian and Woods Index uh, moves down to new lows back to 2020. And I also would point PacWest moving over just as one of the banks uh, having a tough afternoon of it. Jeff Rosenberg, the fact is what I'm looking at is a three-month, 10-year spread, the short, short T-bill versus the benchmark. It's in truly in the cliches uncharted territory. It is out 54 fitted standard deviations with a velocity to an ever greater inversion. Which part of that barbell matters, looking at the three-month uh, dynamic or looking at the 10-year dynamic? You're going to hate this answer, Tom, but, uh, you know, both uh, matter, and they're, they're telling you different stories, right? The, the front end is telling you about the extent of where we are in terms of policy and, yep. and, and, the, and the, the tightening that has, has happened. The long end is telling you about the confidence in the market forecast for uh, inflation to turn right back down to 2%. You can also argue, and I think there's merit to these arguments, that there's some risk premium in there. There's some tail risks scenarios that are reflected in, in the 10-year. There is the expectation for the Fed to react to those kind of growth shock, tail risk shock by easing monetary policy. Right. And there's a forecast here that inflation goes right back down uh, to 2% pretty, pretty aggressively. So I think that's what's the message of that deep inversion. You know, you, you can also say that that's telling you that you're not going to get that inflation decline without a deeper recession than, say, Powell is forecasting. Right. So all those things are are in, 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 implicit in that uh, uh, amount of curve. What's inversion. important here, Lisa, is we're going to standard deviation uh, analysis. It seems like not every chart, but half the charts I'm looking at, I'm now looking at the size of the move given the trend, which is what you do with standard deviations. And for Frankly, that's what you do on the edge in crisis coming out of crisis. I mean, that's sort of the tonier you get, again, with SPX off 23 points. And PacWest down 4 percent, a similar kind of move uh, in Western Alliance shares as we degreed heading into the close. I do wonder, Jeff, your comment on Drew Mattis's point, Drew Mattis of MetLife. He wrote in saying, what a missed opportunity to provide relief to the banks. An unexpected pause could have flushed out shorts in the sector and created more breathing room. What is your view, Jeff? Do you think that this was a missed opportunity to throw a lifeline to some of these spiral uh, prices that we've seen in the regional banking sector? You know, he, he sort of got that question a little bit, you know, when he got the question, why, why didn't you pause? And, and he gave an answer that was about getting to sufficiently restrictive. But I, I think the subtext, which he didn't discuss, but I think it is something that is important, is the potential for creating an overreaction by financial markets, right? So he was very much taking pains to not use the word pause, leading you basically up to it without saying it. And I think that was prescripted, again, to avoid what we had seen in other uh, FOMC uh, press conferences, a, an overreaction, a, a too large of an easing in financial conditions, right? So remember, the Fed's perspective here is we haven't won the battle on inflation. Inflation is still well way too high, 4.6% on core PCE. So they don't want to 
give the market any reason to ease the financial conditions tightening. And I think the pause and the early pause, and yeah, there is a banking system perspective on that, but there's yeah. the broader system perspective and that the tightening in credit conditions is actually aligned with their inflation objectives. And so they don't want to push too far back uh, against that and create an unintended easing in financial conditions uh, at this point in the inflation fighting, which is not yet uh, won. You need a PhD in psychology. <laughs> Jeff Rosenberg at BlackRock. Jeff, thank you, sir. Yeah. No, that's thank you accurate. very much. Talk, that's accurate. Talk about surveillance. You're talking about <laughs> all of the above, the, uh, right? Game theory. Your equity market hear. breaking down a little bit here. I've got to say, PacWest is down about 3.8 percent or so. Western Alliance is negative as well. We're down two there by 4 percent. The equity market breaking down on the S&P by 0.6 percent. Here's a final line from Thomas Thornton of Hedge Fund Telemetry. No rate cuts for you. Seems to be the takeaway right now. <laughs> Going into the close, here's some coverage for you. Seema Shah, Chief Global Strategist at Principal Asset Management alongside Scala Fu and Romain Bostic. Looking forward to their conversation tomorrow morning on Bloomberg Surveillance. Ben Laidler, Jane Foley, Wei Li. We go from the Federal Reserve to the ECB tomorrow. Apple after the close on Thursday, then on to payrolls. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV and radio. This was Bloomberg Surveillance. This is Bloomberg.